Hello and welcome to the Creative Lotus Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Zaki. Once you figure out the Achilles heel of the character, everything that they say or do in the play, movie, or story usually overcompensates for the very thing that they're trying to cover up. Sound familiar? So when we start to identify what our fundamental weaknesses are, arrogance, anger, hatred, racism, hostility, insecurity, when we start to get to the root causes of those, we all have fundamental weaknesses. How do we transform those weaknesses into to more positive? How do we take those lower worlds and turn them into upper worlds? Hello, and welcome to the Creative Lotus Podcast. On this week's episode, we have actor, producer, and self-tape coach, James Dumont. Please enjoy this episode. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, so James, uh, for everyone that wants to know more about you, and I always ask everyone to kind of get things started, can you share with us where you're born and raised? And ultimately, like, how did you, you know, get into this industry as an actor? We'll start there. Got it. Uh, I was born in Chicago and mm-hmm. raised in Chicago and New York. My parents are divorced, so I lived between Chicago and New York for most of my wow. youth. Okay. Until I was 15. Uh, I was a uh, I was a Gerber baby. My 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 mug was picked on the bottles of the Gerber things as a as a small wow. as a small wee baby, uh-huh. and then uh, I was a Chicago theater actor. Like I was, uh, I did you know McDonald's commercials early on. I did uh, you know I, I was an extra in Risky Business. Then I did my first speaking role was in the movie Class. You know Rob mm-hmm. Lowe and Andrew McCarthy. Uh, I went to high school with John Cusack and Jeremy Piven. They were, you know, Jeremy was my year. John was like a year behind us. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then I did like theater. I did like lots of plays, you know, student, as a kid. And and then um, I got my SAG card in 1980 uh, nice. as being one of the kids dancing in the streets, you know, uh, on in the movie Blues Brothers. So that was my first oh, wow. kind of like professional foray. I got my equity card, I think it was earlier than that, because I did Oliver Twist. I was an understudy at Ol- as Oliver Twist in the Airy Crown Theater. So it was like, I think that was in like 77 or 78, somewhere in there. Mm. So I've been kind of doing it, you know, as a, as a kid. And then I kind of stopped and played baseball. But I went to college. I went to Boston University. I, I got a, mm-hmm. a theater scholarship to BU. I only went for a couple of years. Um, and then I went to New York and did uh, like about 200 plays in New York. Wow. And um, yeah, I just kind of, I, I had 200 bucks and I had I, a friend of mine that I went to college with had an extra room, which was really like just the library. Uh, I was <laughs> allergic to cats and there were two cats in the place. So I was like, oh. and of course the cat box is in my room. <laughs> of like, course. It's terrible. <laughs> and then, um, you know, but I moved to New York with like 200 bucks, you know, like I just, wow. uh, you know, the summer of... Uh, summer of 85 and uh you know waited tables when i first started out uh and then my father died in the fall of 85 i'd only been in new york mm-hmm. you know three four months and um it was like my father died and i had an apartment and so you know after he passed and we buried him i went back to new york and kind of started my life pretty much you know i was 20 years old wow. and uh but yeah, like I think I think my first year in New York, my my annual I went did my taxes. I think my annual annual salary was six thousand a year. <laughs> now my rent was two hundred, so it was a little bit you know it was, it was you know like, but I lived on like, uh, you know, pizza bagels, and then you know when I would wait table you know tables, I would take food home, and the chef would make me something or show me how to make some food, and you know like you know living on top ramen and you know just a struggling actor's life. It was it was kind of uh, it was quite fun. You know, it was just yeah. me, two cats and a roommate that I barely talked to, <laughs> you know, two cats that you're allergic to. And yeah, a roommate that's never there. That's yeah. uh, quite the life. A roommate that's never there and is always his girlfriend's house or they're having like oh, loud sex and or, he, or not having loud sex because she had some sort of condition where her, like her vagina would never open up or something. It was, very, it was just like he was just very frustrated. <laughs> It was not, it was not, and she was gorgeous. She was drop dead gorgeous. And I was just like, oh, my oh God. dude, this has got to, this is terrible. You know, yeah. I'm not you. <laughs> um, and I used to be a DJ. I, I, you know, wow. I, I was a, I was a DJ as a kid for like my, you know, my Cub Scout troop. And, yeah. but lucky for me, like I learned how to spin music from a guy named Larry Levan who mm-hmm. DJed at a place called the warehouse, which was where house music started, you know? Oh, wow. And so, um, I was mentored by him and then I, I, you know, I was a pretty, 
I was a, my dad was a salesman, so I was always kind of a young entrepreneur, and I still kind of am. And uh, I had this thing called Teen Disco, which was at a place called Dingbats in Chicago. <laughs> and there was a bouncer named Theo there who later became known as Mr. T. So that was pretty wild. Um, and so when I was in New York, I, uh, I found ways to DJ uh, mostly kind of pulling records for other DJs, you know, for mm. like a guy named Frankie Knuckles, who was really big, uh, Jellybean Benitez, who, you know, did Madonna's first album. And so, you know, I kind of, uh, you know, instead of, I didn't really, I didn't really like waiting tables. So uh, I found myself kind of catering and then kind of DJing and then DJing led to the club, the club scene in New York. So right. uh, that was a, that was the thing that kind of kept me, you know, alive and kind of going. You know, it was just, do you, but you know, you're DJing it till like four in the morning, you know, like, and then you're like, you have a Burger King commercial audition in the morning. And I feel like I have like four hours sleep, you know, like, you know, shaved and rolled in. And, you know, it was like, so it wasn't, it wasn't the most conducive. It was like a, you know, vampire kind of lifestyle it was not, it was not the best, best for those actor days. Yeah. Yeah. But I also think that, you know, you sharing that story of kind of being, uh, you know, the, the poor starving artist or, you know, like really trying to make it like post-college years. Um, I feel like that experience is not really had as much now. And maybe correct me if I'm wrong, you know, by young people that are trying to get into acting um, because it's kind of like, uh, you know, th now we have social media, right? You have like all these other avenues and outlets to kind of put yourself out there and get discovered. Um, not to say that people aren't, you know, poor and starving because there's definitely way too much of that. Um, but yeah, I think so from those kind of struggles, you know, in New York and then kind of how did you kind of maneuver from there? I mean, you did a ton of plays, it sounds like. And then, you know, you're doing commercials and auditions and everything. Um, kind of how did the ball get rolling on that uh, for you to kind of see success, you know, and to kind of like make it stay in this biz uh and and keep your career going yeah i think it's uh it's to make a really good point is that you know i have uh i you know i've been coaching and teaching you know for like the almost you know be eight years this fall and um and the last three years you know hyper vigilant and focused on, you know on zoom when every when the world kind of went indoors Right. I just happened to be a guy that, like, you know, did 15 years of self tape and booked well over a million dollars worth of work. So I felt like, you know, when COVID hit, I was like, you know, the guy that had water in the desert. I had just plenty, <laughs> I just had buckets of gallons of water from experience. But mm -hmm. you make a good point is that, so I have like a thousand students now on Zoom wow. all over the world. And, amazing. Um, it, yeah, it's amazing to me. But you're right. There is, there is this kind of, uh, what I want to call shortcut, you know, version to trying to be an actor by, you know, the people doing tons of TikTok, being an influencer, but right. it doesn't mean that you're able to deliver a truthful, honest, grounded performance as, as a human being. Yeah. You know, being popular and being successful doesn't mean you're excellent. And the people that I found that are in our business are uh, committed to achieve excellence and continue to thrive in that the excellence zone. You know, there's a big difference between excellence and success, and everybody has a particular definition of success. But for me, you know, success is temporary and fleeting and largely in the hands of other people. Uh, excellence is largely within your control. So mm. I think for me that, that um, to swing back to those early days, I think I was chasing uh, success and I wasn't as diligent and dedicated to excellence as I am now. And I mean excellence, not in the sense of perfection, but maybe striving for it, but not necessarily feeling like I have to achieve that. Um, yeah. There are there are actors' works who, or bodies of work who I aspire to work at that level. The Daniel Day Lewis's mm -hmm. and the Gary Oldmans of the world, you know that level of, of fully character commitment, specificity, you know. But these are these are well crafted. And well-trained actors. I think that the the thing that we're facing now is that people are looking for the shortcut and the easy way to go. Um, and I've never really seen that work out in the forty years I've been doing this. So I think mm -hmm. there's, I think I I try to instill in my students a sense of um, I give them tools and techniques that sometimes are very technical, but it's really up to them to turn them into art, meaning making them second nature and kind of real. I've, I've never been on a set with an influencer. Um, I don't think I, the kind of sets that I'm on 
would would even like court the idea. Right. I think there's some possibilities for people to crossing over, but it's almost like, you know, to me, it's like porn stars getting, you know, becoming actors. It's like, yeah. okay, you know, you can, you can do that, but let's look at the percentage and the odds of those who have done that. Um, and again, not to be disparaging. I think it's interesting when you find create interesting content for millions of people, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a skill set there. Like I, I watched this one particular comedian who I love his stuff on Instagram. And then when it came to his TV show, it's like, the guy can't act. The guy, you know, he's, he's a funny comedian. I've, I've seen tons of comedians who are super, super solid in stand up, but yeah. they're just not actors. You know, they're not all, they all can't. Robin Williams was an exception, you know, yeah. and other, other people are exceptions. Ray Romano is our exception. There's exceptions to those rules, but the percentages are fairly low. So I feel like mm. it's interesting how we're at a time that we're very, and this really kind of ties into my practice. I started, I got introduced to Buddhism in 1988. Um, my mm -hmm. cousin, who was pretty much like my brother and was there by my side when my father passed away and we drove back mm -hmm. and forth from Chicago to New York together, you know, he, uh, he shakabuku and introduced me to the practice and, uh, you know, uh, 88. So I was 20, 23, I was 23 years old when I began practicing. And so I think for me, it was like, I always knew that I had an inherent, um, the uh, uh, natural ability and skills I had, I was really able, you know, I could talk to anybody. I was not, I didn't have a lot of fear. And so I knew I had inherent skills. I just didn't have technique. And I, mm. so I really kind of winged things, you know, and just did it on my personality and a whim and yeah. that got, you know, and that, and swagger and arrogance and, you know what I mean? Cockiness, you know, only got me so far, but mm. I couldn't necessarily repeat, if somebody gave me a note or direction in a play or, or, a, you know, uh, or an audition room or in a callback situation, I yeah. just didn't know how to process that information because I didn't know what I did the first time. I just kind of just winged it. And right. so at a certain point I started to study, you know, so when I began practicing, um, you know, Buddhism, uh, I really started to, uh, I needed to look closer at, the root causes of my life. Mm -hmm. I, I realized that I was, you know, this is part of my, from my experience that was in the world tribune is that I, I, I started to chant and realize that I was part of a, a three generations of men who mm -hmm. were irresponsible and would cave, you know, to their own weaknesses, uh, mm -hmm. whether it be other women, uh, alcohol, mental abuse, me you know, mental health. Um, right. but they were all, you know, I, I'd come from a generation of saboteurs. And so I think, I, I guess I didn't realize that till I began practicing because I, it was interesting. I had this kind of life where, you know, these amazing things would happen and then I would say or do something and it would all, <laughs> it would all go away and destroy it. You know, like I would mm -hmm. say something to someone or, or do something that, that would undermine and, 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 diminish or, or, or ex exhaust, you know, whatever that great thing that happened. And I just, when I began to chant, I started to figure out that's who I was and that's who I came from. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't necessarily know how to, how to change it or navigate my way through. I think the smart thing for me is that I had a, an amazing group of, uh, you know, young men's Buddhist leaders, a guy named Sergio Jacala, Larry Singer, who's a teacher in, in, in New York now. Um, mm -hmm. I had people who were very um, kind of filling in the gaps of my fatherhood, you know, my having a father. And, yeah. uh, and, and I had, you know, Mr. Kasahara in New York. I had uh, Tara Kassan. I had Danny Nagashima, you know. So I had these kind of uh, really good men who were dedicated to uh, changing themselves, you know, life by life and, and influencing mm -hmm. young men like myself. So, yeah. you know. I had a lot of hard, I, I, I seemed to always kind of learn the lessons the hard way. Right? <laughs> and yeah. so when I began to practice, I, I started to find ways to um, better navigate uh, myself in certain business and certain cir circumstances, you know, shut my <laughs> mouth, listen. <laughs> and, um, you know, those were some of my kind of challenges early on. Yeah.
No, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. You know, this, this podcast, as you mentioned, you know, you practice with the SGI in Nichiren Buddhism and, um, yeah, to, to have been introduced at such a young age and to continue, you know, into, you know, all of these years, I'm, like you said, I'm over 40- 57 years old. This is my 35th year of practicing this wonderful Buddhism. You know, it's like, yeah. but my life would never have unfolded anywhere near. I never would have comprehended what my life would have, you know, that I have these wonderful children and a wife and the kind of life I have. I live in a beautiful home in New Orleans. I own my home in Los Angeles, you know, uh, but I, I, and I, you know, I I just finished my 80th feature film. I have like another, you know, 80, you know, 80, 80 to a hundred episodes of television, you know, like this, if you were to ask me at 22 years old, if I even remotely thought that was possible, that just, I, I always dreamed of those things and aspired for those things. I just didn't necessarily know how to go about doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the name of the uh, podcast is the creative Lotus based on this Buddhist philosophy of, you know, cause and effect or Renge, the Lotus flower, you know, both blooming and seeding at the same time, but it's from that shit or muck underneath that this Lotus flower is even able to bloom. So I'd like to ask each guest that I have on, you know, kind of what is your Lotus flower moment and ultimately kind of what was the shit or muck that you had to go through that really you feel ultimately led to the fruition of this beautiful Lotus of your life. You know, you just shared, you have this home in both Los Angeles and New Orleans and this amazing family and everything. But, um, if you kind of can expand upon that, I'd love to hear. Yeah, I think. And, uh, and I was glad that you swear because, uh, you know, I swear like a sailor. So when <laughs> yes, now that you say you're going to, you're going to find now it's going to be the next half of this interview is going to be F bombs all over the fucking place. <laughs> I love um, it. I was being very polite in here, just, but, but yeah, you know, that whole concept and analogy that that our lives like the, the lotus flower can't grow in in a, in clear water it right. has to have the mud and the nutrients and the, the you know the mud it has to have all of those we have to have the obstacles yeah. in order to become this beautiful flower that bears fruit right. you know but i think we're in a society now and even when i was growing up is the idea is to avoid conflict is to avoid complication is to um is to is to not necessarily avoid it but it's like do your best to not uh, um to of to not of to obstacles meaning like you don't yeah. want to face obstacles when 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 you get to chant for a period of time you start to realize like No, the shit that you're going through, the things you're going like my life never would have unfolded in the clear. If if I got all the things I wanted, I would I would be an entirely different person, way arrogant and probably out of this business. Hmm. And it's because that because of the humility and the the uh, the empathy that I had to have for myself and the empathy I had for I had for others and the compassion I had to have for myself and the compassion I had to have for others has made me more of an empathetic, compassionate person. Yes. But I was not that person. I think the thing is, is I think when you, uh, what we like to call in, in the acting world, the the aha moment or the, uh, people say coming to Jesus moment or the yeah. the, the huge <laughs> realization. And I think I, I think I kind of mentioned it a bit, which is that once I figured out that I was cut from the cloth of genera- three generations back of fuck ups, men mm-hmm. who were irresponsible and didn't and then i found myself exactly in that same position of me abandon you know, leaving my kids at home with my wife working 60 hours a week and me on the road chasing every job like i'm a door to door salesman mm-hmm. and i'm i'm re- i'm giving up my responsibility as father in exchange for having the kind of career that i always wanted and i justified and rationalized myself that way and it right. caused my wife a great deal of suffering and it caused my children a great deal of suffering. And I think, and that was was very hard to face that I was responsible for that. And that I, the thing that always kind of fired me up when I was younger was that I didn't want to be like my father. I, I wanted to be nothing like my father because that would just sicken me to no end. Yeah. And I think the big, you know, kick in the nuts was you're your father. Yeah. Like here you are on the road away from your kids. Yes. You are, you know, getting jobs. Some 
are bringing enough money home. Some are not. Some are break even just to keep the in, to keep insurance for the kids, you know. But it's yeah. like, but you're not there. You're absent. And and all of a sudden, I had like this huge surge of work, you know. Like when I started, because my I I had heard the tax credits were here in Louisiana. I ran into a friend. He said he did a whole bunch of movies here. My wife is from Baton Rouge. You know, mm-hmm. L.A. was extremely expensive. My kids were in still public is. school. She was a, you know, a partner at a law firm. I was making – and we still couldn't make ends meet. We had a half-million-dollar house. We still couldn't live. We couldn't yeah. make it. Yeah. And we're doing everything. In my, you know, she's working 60 hours. I'm on the road. I'm picking up the kids at school when I'm there. I'm, I have my, you know, actor friends who are, like, you know, becoming babysitters and picking up – like, I, we were doing every – like, it was just hard. It was just so incredibly hard. Right, and then at a certain point, I, 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 you know, I kept, I really chanted and, and really said, "This is unsustainable. This is mm-hmm. not working. My wife is unhappy. I'm, I, I'm, I'm getting some success. I'm growing, but my kids don't see me. Um, and then when I am home, I'm like, you know, super dad, and she doesn't get to see them. And it, it just was just, it was just a, a powder keg." Hmm. And I kept chanting. I said, I got to get a job that gets me to Louisiana. I got to find a way in which to change our lives. I Hmm. have to, this has got to happen. I made a determination. And then I got 12 weeks of work, which I haven't had 12 weeks of work on the same project since Hmm. on Deepwater Horizon. And I didn't know it was as large of a role as it was. I did my self tape audition and then Peter Berg, the director wanted to meet me. So I flew in. And and my wife and I were talking about renting a house in New Orleans for the summer just to see if we could, you know, if the kids could handle the heat of Louisiana summer. And so I had gone to look at a place during our spring break that we were going to try to rent for the summer because I wanted to have my 50th birthday party here. And then I booked this 12 week job. Wow. And it pays enough money to cover my mortgage back in L.A. for the summer. It pays, you know, they're paying for the rent of the place. And I can have a 50th birthday party at this, you know, at this at this house. And so. So we did it. We, you know, for the summer, like I'm doing every day I had a job. I was working every day, um, 12 weeks, run of the picture, uh, you know, number one of the call sheet was Mark Wahlberg. Number two was Kurt Russell. Number yeah. three was my friend uh, Doug Griffin. I'm number four wow. on the call sheet of a hundred and fifty million dollar Lionsgate movie. Number five was a friend of mine from Louisiana. Number six was Golden Globe winner Gina Rodriguez. Number seven below me was John was Oscar winner John Malkovich. And I was like, so this 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 miracle I say miracle, but it's like this is what this was beyond what I ever expected. Um, I had heard about an amazing school called NOCA which is a 50-year-old arts conservative, about to be 50-year-old arts conservatory school here in New Orleans. More kids go to Juilliard from that school than any other school in the country. Musicians, dancers, actors. Wendell Pierce went there. He's a dear friend. I said, look, dude, can you get my daughter an audition? <laughs> I was like, I'm not, no preference, just an audition. Like, if they yeah. like her, they don't like So a week before we were going to move back, my daughter gets, she gets into NOCA. We were going to go back to Los Angeles. She was going to go to Santa Monica High School. And then Mm -hmm. I was scrambling to find a school for my son. He was starting – my daughter was starting high school. My son was starting middle school. Mm -hmm. And um, earlier in the summer, I was playing baseball with my son. And this guy came up to him and said, man, your son's got a really good, you know, uh, know, pitch. And I was like, yeah, you know, like where do you go? I'm the baseball coach at Stewart Hall School for Boys. I was like, I I don't know what that is. And he goes, well, it's a feeder school. It's a middle school for, you know, kids to go on to Jesuit High School. And I was like – Jesuit high school. That's like the best, you know, high school in the city, you know, at one of the best. And so I called the guy up and I said, look, my daughter got into NOCA. Uh, is there room in sixth grade for my son, his son? You know, and uh, he's like, yeah, let me call the headmaster. And the, and the headmaster, like wow. 10 minutes later, said, well, Mr. Dumont, I just, you know, want to let you know that my my uh, DVD library has the movie SWAT and it has Sea Biscuit and has Catch Me If You Can. He was like... Uh, if your son is uh, anywhere near as talented as you are, it's like, I, th- I think we need to meet this young man. You know, I heard he has a mean curveball, you know, and and so I said, well, yeah, let's uh, can we meet and go? How, how about this afternoon? I was like, yes, let's go. <laughs> it was like, And so here we were on the eve of my 50th birthday in New Orleans. I had friends flown in. My best friend I've known since I was 10 years old flew him in. We had an extra bedroom from him. My mom was here, you know, uh, 
all my all my friends were you know it, here in in New Orleans. We had a you know just before my fiftieth birthday. We find out my son gets into the middle school. My daughter gets into this amazing high school. They call back to say it's not going to be just the afternoons. She's going to get full time school. We just we, we we made a spot for her. They said we don't have a spot, but we made a spot for her. Wow. And then I had to turn to my wife and go, "Hun, I got to stay here and take care of these kids and put them through school for the fall. Mm-hmm. Are you okay with going back home alone in that house for the next three months?" by yourself and every two weeks to come visit us, you know, and I'll be single dad. And it was just like, it was really, really difficult, Mm -hmm. really, really hard, you know, for my mom, my wife to come home. And it's like, you know, she walks by the kids rooms and there's nobody in it. And she's Mm -hmm. going to the grocery store thinking, Oh, you know, Sinclair would love. Oh yeah. they're, They're So I, I had a man up. I had a man up and be and do it all. I was teaching at the time. I still had money from, you know, I was getting auditions. I was working here and there, but I was single dad. I was driving the kids to school. I was mm-hmm. doing lunches, breakfast, uh, helping with homework. My wife would fly in every couple of weeks. Wow. And uh, by December, it was just, it was too much, you know? So, wow. you know, something had to give. And so then we kind of, you know, put the house on the market. We had to get the house done put the house on the market. You know, she had to take care of things there. She had to leave the one and only, you know, partner, huge partner job that she had in Los Angeles mm-hmm. for the unknown. Right. You know, for the, the possibility of who knows what, you know. Mm. And uh, eight years later, <laughs> everybody, everybody's thriving. You know, my wife works part time from home, takes a gets up at four or five in the morning because she's an early morning person, takes a little midday nap, walks the dog, mm. uh, works part time, doesn't work more than 25 hours instead of 60 hours a week. Wow. Um, we live in a 150 year old, you know, historic New Orleans home. My daughter has a free scholarship to Cornell University. She's about to graduate from Cornell this this uh, this spring. Wow. My son is pays for his own college education <laughs> uh, for Bennington College because he and I are both on a TV show called The Righteous Gemstones. So yes. yeah, you know, eight years later, you know, we're all doing well, but. Just like that money dirty swamp, it was just, it was not easy at all. There was no, yeah. it was hard for everybody. Socializing for the kids to transition, you know, the high school for the first time. My son for a middle school when there's kids that, you know, have known they've known each other since you know pre K. So yeah, you know it's it's, but you know when you when you look back on it over time, you start to go. There was no other way to do that. Yeah, you know. My life unfolded exactly the way, it, better than I ever imagined it would be, and and don't get me wrong, we still have, we all have, we all have particular. Everybody's having struggles, but you know, we start to realize that those are that our obstacles are opportunities, and once you figure that out, then you're like, oh, okay, I know what to do. You know, game on. Chant, take action. Chant, yes. study, take action. Chant, study, take action. Repeat, do it again. You know, because it's like. There's no way that I would be able to manage a thousand students, you know, by parenting response, although now both kids are out of the house, but our relationship and everything without having a high life condition, like I, it's, it's, it, it beholds, it's up to me, you know, as, as real, you know, as the real breadwinner. And for the longest time I was not, you know, my Mm -hmm. wife was, I was not working as much as an actor. My wife was subsidizing my acting income. You know, and now it's my acting and teaching that basically, you know, are the majority. She works and does very well on part time, um, but but the bulk of the responsibility is on my shoulders, you know, yeah. and that's not lost on me. But also, I'm not cowering away from it as the men before me. So, I mean, that that, you know, they talk about changing generational karma, three generations forward and three generations back. You know, that's it. I mean, that's what I'm that's exactly what I'm doing. And I'm yeah. trying to instill in both my children the ability to um, have, you know, eternal. My son, my son Kelton practices. My my daughter does not, but mm. she's very supportive. But she's also, you know, single-mindedly, you know, single-handedly, basically, kind of changed and transformed. You know, she was the one that created the free ride to Cornell. 
that has mm. nothing to do with me. That's her 100% her accomplishment. Yeah. You know, she, she did that on her own. Um, so there's that. Yeah. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, lost all of that. There. You there? <clears throat> No, thank you so much for sharing all that. I think that's incredible, uh, you know, that this Buddhism does teach, you know, that, like you said, you can literally transform anything in your life if you're willing to put in the effort. And obviously, you know, you said you've put in so much effort over eight years of time um, that, you know, you've created this amazing life, this lotus life, if you will, uh, you know, in New Orleans and have, you know, you're raising the next generation of young people, you know, to take on kind of the lead, which is uh, incredible. Um, I wanted to know, it, what do you consider to be kind of your greatest personal achievement uh, that maybe you're not necessarily known for? You know, you are a well-known actor as you, you know, your son's school, the, you know, that the head head guy was like, I've seen you with this and this and this and this, right? But in your, you're very much out there, but uh, maybe something that you hold really personally uh, as a, an amazing achievement, uh, but maybe not everyone else knows about. I think on on the uh, I think the achievement that most people would be no, uh, if, you know I say this and it's a terrible thing to say but if I were to die tomorrow, you mm-hmm. know they're going to say the guy that played Jared Leto's dad in Dallas Buyers Club. It's like mm. I, I, I at least had the project that everybody in the world kind of saw, and yeah. what was interesting about that role was that it was so incredibly different from me as a person. You know mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not that person, you know? Yeah. Um, but I, but I, but over time I've really kind of learned and had to educate myself of like, wow, I really thought I was not this person, but I, but I find myself being transphobic about certain things. Mm. And I was just like, wow, I never would have figured that out had I not played this character that I, that, that at the time, and I'd still totally disagree with this guy's point of view, the character's point of view of, of um, abandoning your son because of right. who he is or who he has yeah. always been, you know? Um, and so um, in that regard, it was interesting how that a, a role that was so incredibly far removed from me I started to, because I had a responsibility to play this kind of character. And basically anybody who was gay that was on the carpet, no one wanted to talk to me because I represented every parent or every person who was transphobic and every person who didn't love and accept their gay son or daughter. You know, that's Mm -hmm. who I, that's the role that I was playing. Right. 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 And it was very hard to be in that position because I was not that person, but I was treated as that person. Because mm-hmm. I did such a, a good job of being that. And right. then over time, I started to realize that when certain people and friends of uh, my kids were coming over, I started to realize that, wow, I, my, my viewpoint is so narrow. narrow. It's not as, as, as extreme as that guy, but my mm-hmm. viewpoint is kind of narrow. And I think in terms of... Um, it ties into your to your to your question of of what I think is probably the most, and I'm still in the midst of it. Is I think the thing that I wanted to instill in my children the most is their ability to give and to receive love more than any accomplishment. I think at, at a basic rudimentary level is the, the ability to be able to give and receive love. And you would think it's a very simple, easy thing to do, but it's actually very, very complicated for some people and myself included yeah. is sometimes when you're, and this is a thing that I just, you know, when I'm working with my students, sometimes I find blocks and, and ways and people are sometimes some, one of my students, for example, is a Buddhist and she, she's just hypercritical. She like just totally, you know, just, you know, on shih tzus herself or she's, you know, <laughs> slanders herself all the time. She's just hypercritical. She also comes from a very tough, rigid Filipino family. So mm. there's a, there's a cultural, uh, uh, you know, it's never going to be enough for mom and or dad, you know? So there's another, that's a, that's a, again, see how these generational things that we kind of inherit. But nice. I think in terms of the accomplishment thing, I think that I'm, I'm hoping, and I think I'm, and I think I'm having much more success with, with my son, Kelton, in this regard than my daughter, because my daughter is much like her mom, extremely and fiercely independent. 
She's extremely mm. independent to the point of ridiculousness. You know, I want to give more and help more. She doesn't need or want that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, so she's like, I got all the love. I, you know, like, I know that you're there and I'll call you when I need you. You know what I mean? Which is very frustrating for, you know, that like, I just overly want to help in every way. But she's like, yeah. you're helping me by leaving me alone and letting me be my own person, you know? Yeah. And, and so, so I think, you know, the idea of, I think the biggest accomplishment is, 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 and I, and it, and it's a goal and a mission in terms of my teaching as well, mm-hmm. is that right now we're in a, we're in what's called a power vacuum in a historical sense we're, we're that everything is about power, money, mm-hmm. influence, um, you know, we're 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 definitely in a mapo world, is if you want to look that term up. But we are in a we are in what in animality right now. Animality is the game. You yes. know, influencers and power and money and likes and and uh, falsehoods and you know, we're at a time where there's a false idea that if you talk down to someone you think is better than you, it's going to rise your station up, right? Mm-hmm. So the people yeah. do, you know, there's Karens and Kens who are just, you know what I mean? Like it's. It, it, it's okay and acceptable to publicly be be racist, and it's okay and acceptable to say the things that I wouldn't say to your face. Fa- I'm going to say it to your face now. You know, it's like no, that's that's not it. And yeah. I think what's happening is I'm starting to watch this creatively. Is that you know back in this I, I, I was raised in this born in the six mid '60s and to '70s, and there was the, it was the love generation. Like love was a powerful source. Love mm-hmm. could overcome anything. It was, you know, that the, you know, it was a much better word than hate, you know. But love right. was so important to give love and to receive love, and it's all, it's a love fest, and we love each other, and we're gonna love the moment, and we're gonna love the planet, and we're gonna love all colors and races, and we're gonna love poor, you know. And, and now it's just like it's, it's all power, it's all who has the power. How do you take it away? How do you get it? If I have lots of likes, or if I'm, uh, or if I'm from poverty and I have lots of wealth and I can show it, show my wealth that gives me power. So we're in a power vacuum right now where the falsehood is, is feeling like the po- that hate and power are more, are more valuable and sustaining than love. So mm-hmm. this for me, accomplishment wise, I feel it's like the thing that I'm, it's a long game. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, it's a long game because the short game is hate, hate, Hate and separatism and power is 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 is, is all short lived, but and it leads and it leads to hate leads to hate, violence leads to violence, power leads to power, and and nobody wins, you know, and and divisiveness, you know, trying to really keep, you know, uh, trying to uh, point out and emphasize and falsely uh, put Americans against Americans. I mean, it's just like it's. Just, you know, this is a historical time. Yes. And I feel it's like we're, I'm, my whole mission is based in love. I, lo- I try to love every person. I try to find, I try to love myself in order to me be able to give and give love, you know, more unconditionally. Mm-hmm. Um, even though I had an interesting conversation lately about, is, is there such thing as con- unconditional love? Because when you give, mm-hmm. when you just give unconditionally, it feels amazing, and I guess that's a condition that that feeling amazing is a condition of it, sort of. But <laughs> I just feel like accomplishment wise, I just feel we have we have to focus more on love than hate, and we have to focus more on the things, the humanities, and the the the, the what my teachers would say is you know the the human universals. What are the human universal things that we all go through? You yeah. know, I say to people, it's like, I don't care who you are. We all take a shit the same way. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you're the president. It doesn't matter. Like we all, you know what I mean? We all have one heart. We all have, a, hopefully all have two lungs. DeGrasso Tyson was saying, you know, like that, that all the things that all the chemicals that we have in our body or the atoms that we have in our body are the same th- of the earth. It's like, yeah. we're all, as we know, in Buddhism, the person and the environment are one. Yes. And because we've been poisoned in the environment, people are becoming poisoned too. Yes. And and so I feel like accomplishment wise, you know, my mission and my goal when I'm given creative uh when I'm when I'm given when I'm given material 
that I have to create a human being. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I, I do, I, I work in a way that I, like my teacher's Larry Moss, who's usually thanked on the Oscars, you know, Helen Hunt and uh, Hillary Swank and, you know, Michael Clark Duncan, like, you know, he, he trains you know, Brad Pitt, he trains uh, Leo DiCaprio, you know, like Larry's, yeah. you know, for 50 Heavy years has been the predominant, amazing, the most, the greatest living acting teacher right now, period, end of story. And Larry would say, you know, try to find the characters. He goes, but start with yourself. Try to find what's your Achilles heel. Hmm. What's the what's, what's your kryptonite? What's the thing that that is prohibiting you from being the fully evolved and grown person that you are? Hmm. And I thought that's the most fascinating way for you know. He said, do that now. Find it. Find out what your Achilles heel is, right? And learn to learn to. To, to make peace with it, learn to change it, transform it, right? So for me, arrogance was my thing. And arrogance just stemmed from anger of my father not loving me in the way that I wanted him to or being feeling abandoned, right? So what happens yeah. is because I, I did, because of that experience, I found myself constantly in a wanting and, and, and seeking things outside of myself, acknowledgement, ego, the sex. Uh, I was never much into drugs, thankfully, or alcohol. Um, but it was like finding ways to, to, you know, looking outside myself for, for, for love and affection and, you know, because I didn't get it from my dad and that's where the anger comes from. And that's where the arrogance comes from and mm-hmm. wielding my God, you know, the God given or natural, uh, talents, wielding those as a, as a sword against other people, you know, mm-hmm. and, and using ideology, like, you know, my success is the greatest revenge, you know, like, like I'm going to get back at every person that ever questioned or doubted me or treated yeah. me less than I'm going to show them, you know what I mean? I get it. It's a good motivator, but it's not, it's coming from a place of hate and anger. It's coming from the low worlds of hell, hunger, and animality. It's mm. not co- anger. It's not coming from a place of Bodhisattva where you have empathy and compassion for people. It's not coming from a, a place of Buddhahood, of unfettered happiness, success, joy, um, possibility beyond your mind and heart could ever comprehend. It's not coming from that world. Now, there is those vehicles of learning and realization. So I'm talking mostly about the 10 worlds for those who are listening. Please, the concept of the 10 worlds, I, I use it in my acting all the time. Because as a human being, we are so susceptible and swayed by the littlest little, you know, the fact that Trump's talking about going to jail. Yes, you, you were criminal back when I knew you and I worked for you in the 80s. It's like, it's what, you know, the emperor's new clothes. Does everybody not know this guy is a criminal? Like, he's a, he's a con man. Like, we all knew this decades ago in the 80s. Like, why is, how is everybody so, the Pied Piper is, everybody's so swayed, you know? And because we don't, because we are lacking in love, because the person did the person that we that we should have loved us and matched us and made and gave us the things we needed, they didn't. So we overcompensate. We we take the we take the safe job of being the lawyer and the doctor to make the money in order to please the parents, in order to live a certain lifestyle. We buy the certain car in order to show people that we're in finance. Right? We live in a certain house. And, like, this is all, it, it's, it's, it's stemming from overcompensation. Mm-hmm. And I always make this analogy because I actually worked for Donald Trump and I know this man very well, very well. Mm. And his checks bounced and he was building Trump Tower and, and the guy still fucking bounces his check. Like this, this person has not changed who they are. But yeah. I, make a, I, I throw out an idea is what if Donald Trump's father loved him unconditionally? just loved him as being his son without ever having to live up to the name, without ever having to be anything, just be a a, a good man. Yeah. And that didn't happen. And look Mm. what's happened. Yeah. I hold him responsible for the millions of lives that were lost during COVID because he was protecting his legacy and his ego over human life. Right. I will forever hold him personally responsible for being the wrong person at the wrong time in the history of our country. Period. Mm. End of story. Because at a crucial moment, he was trying to protect his legacy over the lives of human beings. And that is wrong. Mm. I don't care where you come politically. That is wrong. You can debate it all you want. But what's really heartbreaking about all this is 
is a little Donald Trump that was never loved and accepted for just being a, a young, just being who he is. Yeah. He always had something to prove. And that mm. overcompensation led to people's lives. Do you understand that, that when you really go deep, and that's what the whole lotus flower is all about. Yes. They, th these flowers, the, the roots are deep in the pond. And they need all of those problems and all of those things to become this beautiful flower that mm. bears fruit and blooms and seeds at the same time. Yes. It's not making a... a short-term Christian decisions about the environment because you're not going to be there because you're going to heaven. It's about right. making eternal choices for generations upon generations upon generations because there's because life is eternal. It will transform. Now, human beings on the planet, I'm not so sure. The planet's going to be fine, right? Yes. But how we <laughs> treat each other right now is so incredibly important. Yeah. And yeah the more that someone is pointing out the differences are of our own citizens and dividing us that that's how they're conquering they're dividing us and conquer don't don't take the bait don't yeah. follow the pipe don't follow the pied piper piping down leading to your demise you know work from yeah. a place of love and that comes from a place of self love and i think one of the greatest self loves is is when i discovered this buddhism is because I had to start to take, and I'm, I'm, that's great, my 83-year-old mother's starting to chant. Wow. And she's realizing that she's been honoring things over people in relationships for almost her whole life. Mm -hmm. And what a, what a painful thing to realize that at 83, because all her friends are dead, I don't right. think they even came to that realization. And yeah. she wants to live to be 100. But what she's realizing is that because of the emotional, physical, psychological abuse that she had as a child, it put her in overcompensation mode, that she had to prove mm -hmm. things, that she had to have things in order to be happy, in order right. to show that she's successful and that she's better than her mother would ever treat her. And I think that, you know, when I began to chant, I had to forgive my father. Mm -hmm. I had to um, learn to love myself mm -hmm. without other people validating that love. Yes. I had to take responsibility for things that I said to people that really hurt people, mm -hmm. that really, um, like people would tell me things and I, I hated being a keeper of secrets because my parents would use each other they would weaponize our ki us kids against each other, against them, each other. And so my mom would tell me this secret that I had to keep and then I would keep it from my dad. And then I had to be the one holding that my dad would tell me something that I had to keep from my mom. And I hated being in that position. I had to be, yeah. you know, in the middle of this warring faction. And so there were times in my life when people would tell me stories and I would freely just tell somebody else and it would get back to them like, why did you tell that person? I go, yeah, I, I'm not really good at keeping secrets. And they're like, I can't trust you. Mm. I told you this thing, piece of information, I can't trust you. And I was like, yeah, I, I just, my early traumas, you know, I'm not, I, I don't like being, I don't like having to be holding secrets. So I, I yeah. just, I get, I, I passed it on so I don't have to hold it. You know what I mean? But I realized <laughs> that that hurt people. That made people right. not trust me. That made people not want to be around me. And that isolated me and made me more alone. And there was a time in my practice just before I met my wife where I just ripped the Band-Aid off of everything. Hmm. I was in uh, Tony and Tina's wedding. Thanks to my fellow Buddhists, I went to a Buddhist convention and I met the people of Tony and Tina's wedding, which still runs today. It was created by Buddhists. Many, many people in the original company were all Buddhists. And so I, I had a full-time paid acting job, you know, five nights a week, six nights a week doing this play that still runs to this day. I quit mm -hmm. the play because the actors weren't, weren't improving and keeping things fresh. I didn't like it. I wasn't, I was not mm -hmm. happy. Hmm. I quit a full-time paid acting job. Wow. The thing I've been striving for my whole life. I had a roommate who was a cocaine addict and addicted to picking up transvestite hookers home at our house, which made things very, very, you know, difficult. very difficult <laughs> picking up crackheads and bringing them home. 
you know, yeah. trying to go take a shower and it's like, wh- wh- what is going on in the bathroom? There's like three people Yikes. in the bathroom. Like, what's happening? Yeah. And, and so I left that three bedroom apartment, moved into a studio. I had an agent that I just signed with. And then the next day when I went to go drop off picture and resume, the guy didn't even recognize who I was from the night before. I fired his ass. So I fired wow. my agent. I quit the paid acting job. I moved out of the apartment, moved into a studio apartment. I made a, a vow of celibacy because, again, one of my overcompensation was, you know, I was a DJ in clubs and I liked women. And so I was always I didn't like to sleep alone. So I whatever, <laughs> whatever, whatever, whoever came home. So be it. Yeah. I decided to do a vow of celibacy and it left me with just my Buddhist practice, some catering jobs. <laughs> and that was it. And my studio apartment and DJ. Yeah. And I spent an entire year like working on James, mm-hmm. getting rid of all the distractions. Don't worry about agents. Don't worry about the business. Don't worry about an acting job. Don't worry about relationships. You got your studio apartment. You got your gohunzan. And you're going to chant and you're going to do activities and you're going to DJ to make money and fuck everybody else. You know, like that's it. (laughs) And it was probably one of the best things I did. It got me immediately right back to therapy because my therapist was like, I was like, I was a fucking mess. And he goes, look, dude, you got, you got the trifecta in here. It's like some people do a job change and it takes them six months to work through the therapy on that. Some people move and it takes them six, some people, you know, uh, um, you know, break up in a relationship. I broke up in a relationship that I was in with a girl who was like, no matter what I did, it was never enough. I was like, you know, mm-hmm. you want to have sex. Why don't you just have sex with your dad? Because I'm never going to be as good as him. So why don't you just fuck your dad? And I was just like, <laughs> it was just terrible. So I got rid of the relationship. I was, stu- you know, all I had was me and my Buddhist practice. Yeah. And it was probably one of the best years of my life because I, I stripped away all the distraction. And then, then I really just had to face myself. And then I had to kind of rebuild and I had a chant about the kind of relationships that I wanted. I had a chant about the kind of job that I wanted. I had a ch- chant, uh, uh, you know, chant about the, the kind of career that I wanted to have, the kind of person that I wanted to be, you know? Yeah. And so the therapist was like, man, dude, you're coming in here and you got all like, you're loaded for bear. Like we, I said, some people just have one of these things and you got like four majors and but then even I shakabuk with him because he was like he's like I said, Yeah, but I feel great. I feel that I'm just I just got back to basics, you know, just mm-hmm. taking care of me, my own self love and my own self worth, my value, and figuring out how what my mission is, what my purpose was. Yeah. And almost like a year to the day, uh my brother in law's brother took me out. He said, You're dude, you're You've been celibate for a year. It's like, let's, let's go out. We got to get you laid. <laughs> I think you're just too uptight. <laughs> and so I went to a bar. There was a girl out front smoking. She was really attractive. And I went in the bar, looked around, didn't see anybody like that. So I kind of like that girl out front. I started talking to her. Beautiful from Louisiana. The girl that I was dating before from Louisiana broke my heart. Mm. So I told her that story, which is always a good way to pick up a girl is to tell about the, the, the last shitty relationship yes. you have. Always a, always a good Always a big turn on, you know, it should have yeah, been a red yeah. flag for her. Uh, that's my wife of 27 years. Wow. We've been wow. married 27 years. Incredible. And, uh, and then from then on, I like a friend of mine was, uh, on Broadway doing six degrees of separation a guy named David Eigenberg, who we known as Steve, the bartender from sex in the city. And now on uh, a Chicago fire, mm-hmm. he was going to go do a movie and needed somebody to understudy this off Broadway play called six degrees of separation was doing a student film down in Brooklyn that I had, you know, had a, you know, pull out of and jump on four different trains to get up there. I, and I booked this two week gig and then the show was going to move up to the Broadway house. Dr. Channing was going to come back in the show and, uh, Courtney B Vance was going to be in it. And they were like, yeah, we, we'd love you to have be an understudy for the, you know, the, for the role you did. And that was, I was fully full frontal nudity. I was, I was fully naked in the show. I was running, had a pair of socks was my only costume. And, uh, <laughs> Then David was like, yeah, I'm done doing the show. You can take over the role and you can understudy these other things. And then I'm on Broadway for two years, you know, and, wow. and making I'm walking to work from my studio apartment that I had. And my DJ business was still flourishing. I would actually go set up the DJ gig down at the South Street Seaport, jump on the train, go do six degrees up on Broadway, 730 half hour show was done at 930, get on a train, 
take the train down to the South Street Seaport, DJ for the 10 o'clock cruise, the, tel- the 12 o'clock cruise, break down the thing and bring back, bring, I, you know, bring back to my house. So, you know, had I not spent that full year of kind of like, you know, clean in house, mm-hmm. you know, and taking responsibility for everything. And that's the hardest part, I think, about this practice or life in general. Yeah. You know, I'm having conversations with my mother about how much she has to take responsibility for her narcissism and, you know, uh, her traumas that have manifested in in various ways that are not healthy and don't suit her or us. Yeah. Um, I said, you know, the difference with Buddhism, I mean, and, and she's a, you know, she was a pagan. So she's like, I think she said paganism is older than Buddhism. And I, I don't think that's actually right, but I'll look that up. But. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think in paganism that they 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 ask you to take responsibility for everything. Hmm. You know, your thoughts, words, and actions yeah. all have causes and effects, mm-hmm. and the hardest part is to take responsibility for those, especially when those causes have affected somebody in a negative and adverse way. Right, and um, I had not realized that that would was what I was doing, hmm. and so, you know, from doing the show on Broadway for two years that led to a national tour that moved me to Los Angeles. My wife went, you know, put, put my wife through law school. I was on tour for nine months. I came back with a you know wedding ring. I proposed. We had, you know, kids lived in a beautiful rent controlled apartment in, in Los Angeles and a beautiful neighborhood. Um, yeah. You know, you just, um, I think that, you know, I, I tell these stories in, in, a, in a means to, that I'm, you know, we all we all have the innate ability to kind of transform and change our lives at any point in time. Yes. Uh, the question is how you know how willing are we to do that, and then what tools and what actions do we take in order to uh, unearth that? You know. Right. Manifest and I found it, yeah. that this practice, unlike any other thing that I've done, has deeply and deeply profoundly changed everything generationally. Yeah. And I just, I can't, I'm not aware of any other philosophy or practice that really goes as deep as this one does in terms of that change. So you've, you've kind of tapped into this, uh, and thank you for sharing all of the stories in, in so much detail as well. I think it's quite incredible. You've lived the I life. I haven't had a chance to share like those two big stories in a long, long time. And I'm, I thought this was the perfect place to do it. No, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, you talked about, you know, this weakness of kind of anger. And so I'm curious kind of when you're in the midst of going through it, and it sounds like you've done a lot of, you know, in Buddhism, we talk about human revolution or inner transformation, right? Uh, and you're talking generally generationally as well with family, but kind of when anger rises up in you, even now, you know, in, in your career or just in life in general, uh, what do you do to kind of overcome it in the moment? So you don't get swayed by it. Um, and, and being able to kind of keep moving forward. There's a, uh, there's somebody that I kind of like turn to for a little bit of help in terms of intuition guide, a woman named Lisa Greenfield. Mm -hmm. She's really fantastic. She has a thing called truth in hand. So she does palm work and astrology. And and I've always liked those things as a means to kind of, as a guide, there's no, no exacts. There may be some science to it, but the point is, is that it's always been something to kind of, and she used to said, I used to have a thing. She goes, you know, you can doubt your doubts. Hmm. So there's times where, you know, I'm a grown man with ADHD. My son has ADHD. He takes medication. I don't. Um, but one of the things that happens is there's times where we get triggered by, you know, I get triggered by certain things, you know, that, that are said. Uh, more recently, this these hatred comments about transphobia and that, you know, trans, you know, trans people just came about recently. <laughs> yeah. Just just the mere falsehood of all of that, 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 you mm-hmm. know, this came out of this movement. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's that. So I, I get, I get angered and triggered by that, but I also have to, I have to check myself that these are feelings that they will pass. Mm-hmm. These are, this, these are things that are temporary. This too shall pass. And that, um, I think, you know, the big the big turn I have on things is transforming 
anger into compassion, Mm -hmm. hatred into empathy. So as I said, when I, when I go back to the root causes of where, you know, Trump's narcissism comes from, I, I have, I have empathy and compassion that here's a boy that just didn't get love, you right. know? Right. Now that doesn't necessarily give him a pass and make sure it's okay to continue the hatred and, and falsehood and misinformation. That doesn't make it right. Do you know what yeah. I'm saying? But yeah. I, but it puts it in a certain perspective. Uh, one of the things that my son and I, cause my son goes through, you know, uh, we call catastrophizing. He kind of like, he gets ahead of himself. And so I say to him sometimes, put a, put a, uh, a rubber band on your wrist, you know? Yeah. I said, put a rubber band on your wrist. And every single time that you kind of get ahead of yourself, snap the wrist so that it, it, right. it, it hits your, hits your thing here. Snap your wrist because you're ahead of yourself. And this is the present, <laughs> mm. right? Snap yourself into, into the present. Yeah, yeah. Um, and be careful of – my mom does this too. My mom's like, you know, like, you know, 60, 80 years of catastrophizing. You know, hmm. one box is missing from the movie. Somebody stole it. Somebody – they <laughs> stole it. I said, so let yeah, me get this yeah. right, mom. So they – the box that was shipped and, and I over I overtaped on all sides. <laughs> so they took that one box off, the, off of the moving truck. Yeah. From the other 140 boxes, just want to be clear, and they knew that one had the turntable. I just want to just, they did, and they, all, so they did, they they picked this one box, right? So like, I'm just trying to give her, like, make her laugh and understand the 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 severity of her catastrophe and her logic that it, they stole it. Something stole to me, and I go, well, one has to ask oneself, why does pe- why are people, why why do you keep people feeling like people are stealing from you? Right. Have you stolen from people? Is that mm. is that is that where the root? So for me, I think I the the joy of what I do in creating human beings from cr- given circumstances is trying to get to the root causes of those of who the person is, yeah. and that's why that whole thing about Larry Moss helping me with the getting to the Achilles heel, because he said, and this is very interesting. Once you figure out the Achilles heel of the character, everything that they say or do in the play, movie, or story usually overcompensates for the very thing that they're trying to cover up. Hmm. Sound familiar? (laughs) Right? (laughs) So when we start to identify what our fundamental weaknesses are, arrogance, anger, hatred, racism, hostility, insecurity, when we start to get to the root causes of those – well, look at the car you drive. Look at the clothes you're wearing. Look at the house you have. Like, you know what I mean? Look at your Instagram. Look at how many, how you present. So the idea is that, you know, we all have fundamental weaknesses. It's like, how do we, how do we, how do we transform those weaknesses into to more positive? How do we take those lower worlds and turn them into upper worlds, right? How do we take yes. the hell, hunger, anger, and animality world that we're in and move into learning and realization and bodhisattva and, and, and ultimately Buddhahood. How do we take that? Yeah. You know? And so for me, it's like, I always try to go to what's the root cause. Where does that, where does that stem from? Where does, mm. what, what might that come from? And sometimes I'm chanting and I'm, and I'm, I'm visualizing and I'm going through moments of my life when I'm asking that kind of question. I think what's, what's most interesting about this practice, unlike other things I have you know, people do TM and people do other forms of, you know, Tibetan or other Buddhist meditations where, where they have to extract themselves from society to go away to figure these things out. I'm right. doing it in the comfort of my own home. I don't have to fly. I don't have to go to Tibet. I don't have to shave my head. I don't have to learn to dance. You know, yes. I do have to, you know, but my point is, is that there's an active medit. This, this chanting nam myo renge kyo is this active meditation that allows us to, to, to scroll down and get to the root causes of things. It allows us, as you said, the whole idea of a, a, the whole concept of a human, just think of the word human revolution, mm-hmm. you know, that you are revolutionizing yourself as a, as a human 
human being. You're going to cha- you're going to revolt against the things that are that are harming you and holding you back and hurting other people. You're going to revolt against that. And you're going to and you're also going to revolt and you're going to fight for things that are beautiful and loving and powerful and can transform, you know, can change the world. So you're revolting as a human though, because here's the part, the human part is you're flawed. You know, like you know, you, there's no perfection there. It's, you know, humans are are, you know, uh, constantly imperfect, which is what makes us great, what makes us different than other sentient beings and other animals where we can speak, we can communicate, we can use our words. And how do we use our words? Um, so I feel the idea is like this. What I love about this practice is when I'm chanting, I'm there because my ADD visions and, and things are, are phrases and, and, and life moments and a little visual flashback movie are, are coming into my head. And sometimes I attach myself to an idea of, oh, I need to call my mother. Oh, I need to follow up with that phone call with my sister. Oh, I need to take care of... And then some of those those things I attach to and some I let go. But what mm-hmm. I find what's interesting is what's what's amazing about this practice is the things we can uncover while we're not glued to this fucking thing or the computer yeah. and how, how present we can be and where, where we really, really are. There's, a, there's a, one of my Buddhist meetings that I go to on Sunday, which is, you know, I, I bring everybody to, cause it's just the shakabuku. The more people, there's something about this meeting. that's like all these amazing artists from all over the world meet on Sunday at 11 o'clock mm-hmm. and I'll definitely send you the link. And it's like, it just, there's something about this meeting, the collective wisdom of, you know, many people, 30 to 50 years of practice mm-hmm. and brand new people in there, like totally inspire us. Mm-hmm. And the focus this last week was a honamyo spirit, honamyo mm-hmm. meaning from this moment forward. Right. I think the hard part for us to figure out, at least for myself, there's a lot of pain and suffering and things that we have in the past that we take with us, our personal kind of baggage. What I love about a Buddhist practice, especially because it's in the morning and the evening, is you wake up and this is this is this is your this is your karma collective this is your karma collective bag today. You know, how heavy is it? What's in there? You know? And so you chant to unpack where where your day starts. You know, what, what what's going on? Where are you now? How are you feeling? Did you eat? Did you have sleep well? Do you need more sleep? What about breakfast? Like, you know, where are you? Checking in where you are. Yeah. And and how heavy is your bag starting your day? And then we chant in the evening to have some sort of closure or perspective on where we were and where we started. And then also make a determination for what the next day is. And the mm-hmm. consistency and continuity of that, and I've always had a hard time struggling with that based on my responsibilities and my travel schedule and things like, I'm coming up with excuses. But the reality <laughs> is I've always found that when I'm consistently practicing, morning and evening, even if I'm doing bare basic minimums, five minutes Daimoku, Ganyo, five minutes Daimoku, you know, five Ganyo five is what I used to call it. That's the bare basics. Yes. Then my life condition is basically five Ganyo five. It's just like, eh, you know, if I'm doing 30 minutes Ganyo, 30 minutes Daimoku, man, it's a different day. My son and I had a Tozo going on where we chant for long periods of time called Tozo. There were times where we were doing two hours a day and we we're like, holy shit, this is fucking high. Arc. Like, this is what this is what two hours of Daimoku a day start feels like. Yeah, yeah. this is life on steroids, man. <laughs> like we were both like, what the fuck? You know, yeah. now, can it always be like that? That's up to me. That's just my manner. That's just my you know, as my wife will tell you, my shitty management of time. I'm a terror. I, I, I struggle, you know, because yeah. there's only 18 hours in a day, really. If you think about the sleeping, you know, it's like and even Pretty that gets yeah. messed up. And I don't know what time I go to sleep when. But my point <laughs> is, is that when you're this power of this practice is in the, the ability to maintain, retain and build momentum of a of a high condition of life. That mm-hmm. those little things that you talk about that trigger you don't trigger you anymore. Right. They're just, eh. It's like going through the mail. You know, you're going, oh, yeah, I, IRS, 5000 Okay, great. They, they're going to hit me for a $5,000 bill. All right, that's, oh, I got 10000 back from a residual. Oh, you know, I, like, 
don't be so swayed by the highs or the lows. And I think mm. what happens is if we don't have a greater sense of ourselves, we can easily succumb to listening to false prophets, you know, poisonous, uh, uh, you know, cancerous behaviors, ideologies, thoughts of the world. You know what I mean? Of course, when you when you you know you, you have if you're a dracon draconian style of life, you know that that's what you, the person and the environment are one. I always say to people, it's like when you walk down the street. You may look at your block and go, God damn, it's so shitty. Look how dirty it is. It smells like trash. And this person's, I got a flower shop over here and they leave out all the, oh, it's terrible. That's the next day. Oh man, I love my neighborhood, man. Look how historic it is. Like, it's just my condition of life. It's the same neighborhood. It's the same environment. It has yeah. everything to do with your perspective in life. Yeah. And what I'm what I'm finding that's most amazing about this practice 35 years in, and I can't wait to get to 50. I can't wait to get to 80. Wouldn't it be great to get to 100? I don't know about that, but but uh, but and I say to my son sometimes, you know, like he'll chant a lot, and I don't chant as much as he does, you know, mm -hmm. even though I have more time because he's in college. But it's like <laughs> he goes, man, how, how many how many millions of daimoku do you like? You're just flying right now, and I was like, well, you know, I have a. I have like a little security deposit I have of Daimoku. I have like, you know, a couple billion, you know, 35 years. I got a couple billion of security, like, you know, for my for my Daimoku savings account that when shit goes down, it's like, eh, let me pull out some of that Daimoku that, that, I, that I stored away for the, for a rainy day, right? It doesn't really kind of work like that, but it's it, there's a, something kind of fun in the idea of that. Because I yeah. do feel like my condition of life after all these years is already, you know, high you know when i teach I, i'm super super passionate and i give everything to my students and they know it and they feel it they feel my heart they feel my love they feel my passion they feel my seriousness and commitment to excellence um it can be intimidating sometimes but i i every time i give a note or adjustment it's coming from a compassionate constructive criticism we're building something mm -hmm. together i'm getting better you're getting better there's no destructive behavior there's no uh, power trips. There's no games. Um, and I find that I, I attract a certain type of student who's fucking serious and the, and, and the, the, the hobbyists and the, and the, you know, those who are looking for a quick fix in an easy way, they're going to get a couple little tools from James. That's all I need. I'm good. I'm like, okay, good luck with that. I have 15 years of self tapes. I have thousands of auditions. I have hundreds of, you know, uh, movie set experiences and it's like, you know, you, you're not even catching a, a, you're just getting what you think you need and then to move on. Whereas the people who keep coming back just get stronger and stronger and better. And I, and I don't, and I make them as independent as possible. I don't want them relying upon me. My class is a drop in, drop out. I don't need you to commit to eight to 10 to 12 weeks. I'm not right. trying to make you sick in order to make money and fill a class. I'm trying to <laughs> plant like Buddhism, I'm trying yeah, to plant the seed it's... of enlightenment in yeah. you. I'm trying to plant tools and techniques that you can go out and on your own. I'm not giving you a fish. I'm not telling you I have the secret of uh, the magic sauce of, of fishing. I'm going to teach you how to fish, damn it. Here's a hook. Here's a lure. Here's a good pole. Good places to go fishing. Go to Atlanta. Go to New Mexico. These markets where there's not as many fish, you know. Go where you're going to be appreciated. Go where you're going to have the most opportunities. Go where you can, you know, carve out your own niche. Be a master of your market. Don't chase these bigger markets where there's tens of thousands of people already there that have been there for decades. I think for me, it's like I, I never thought that I would be – that I never thought I would love teaching as much as I do. I don't love it more than being an actor because that's – I was just on set, and let me tell you, you know, the two places I'm happiest is home with my wife and kids and on set. Everywhere else, I'm just not as happy. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. I have found a great deal of happiness and joy and success in teaching and sharing and realizing what my, that my goal and my mission is. Um, and I'm also realizing that it's a form of arrogance in a way in the sense that I know that I'm only physically going to be on the planet for a certain period of time mm -hmm. and that I want to have my impact be greater than any accomplishment in terms of, I don't, I figured out with my Buddhist experience that I thought it was about showing people all of the conspicuous 
achievements of being in an Oscar winning film, working with thing, overcoming these obstacles, you know, daughter having a free ride at college, son paying for his own. I, I thought that was a great way to show people the amazing part of this practice, the, 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 the conspicuous, the, op, the, you know, the goodies, right? Yeah. Yeah. But what I realized is, and this is deeply profound, is it's my human revolution. It's not that I became a great climber. It's not that I became an accomplished climber at the top of the, it. It's because I never gave up. Because I became, it's not about getting to the top of the hill. This is the thing, the misnomer now. It's not, not getting to the top of the hill because there's another hill. <laughs> you know, that's the big aha when you get there. It's like, oh shit, there's more. But yeah. it's how good of a climber I became. How much I didn't give up on myself my family and others and the world and the planet and my view of the planet. Mm. Right. Yeah. So I think the big thing, you know, that I'm realizing in terms of teaching is I can live forever in the hearts and minds of my students because mm. I can give them tools that get, that empower them. It's the same thing as Shakabuku, same thing as giving, sharing this practice with people. I mm. always had a hard time with early in my practice. Because mm -hmm. I felt it was like, ah, this is like proselytizing and I'm on the corner and I'm giving cards to the fucking cab drivers and like they're, you know, just got in this country <laughs> and I'm trying to get them to chant these words yeah. that they don't even like. What am I doing? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But then and now that I realize that I've looked at all the incredible things that this practice has transformed in my life and my kid's life mm -hmm. and how much it has led to being the kind of person that I always wanted to be and I have dreams and aspirations of being so much more mm -hmm. and not necessarily in the eyes of accomplishment in society or you know getting awards but can I train can I change someone's life that changes the course of their life like my assistant for example he's for like we're we're and he chants as well we're we're, we're mm -hmm. deeply connected he was, he was about to be married. He was engaged to a woman that he wasn't really in love with, who they <laughs> wow. were about to get a house, and he was going to live in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And mm. he was a postman, and he did, like, extra work. And I was like, dude, I think you're a really good actor. I think you should come down to New Orleans. I can get you an agent. Mm. One of my students has an extra bedroom. You can see how this goes. Wow. And... You know, you could be my assistant part time and help me with the technical aspects of things. So you have like a part time job, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he did. And it single handedly changed the course of his entire life. Wow. He now works as an actor. He's part time. He's in a relationship with a girl. He's got a, you know, he takes care of my mom part time. Like he he works. I mean, he's got he's had more auditions this week than I did. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so. <laughs> I that's one person that I know that I've definitely transformed the, the, the trajectory of he may have lived and born and died in New Bedford, Massachusetts and never had any of these things. And right, he knows right. that. And I appreciate that. But it's, it's not so much about me. I made suggestions, but he took he had the courage to drop everything to you know, and move his whole life here. And, and that's not every not everybody has that. One of my other students mm -hmm. was was really, really suffering. Friends were dying left and right of of um uh, prescription medication things. And even he Bjork. had had a, 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 a lapse. Wow. And when he got out of rehab, I was like, Hey man, get back into class, move back, move out of your apartment, move in with your parents, save some money, go do some grub hub. And, uh, let's get to work. I did 500 self tapes in the time period. He was with me just wow. finished. He was on a super, just finished doing the, the Samuel Adams Super Bowl commercial. Wow. Just finished doing a supporting lead opposite Ben Foster, <laughs> right? Yes. So it went from being an extra and, and watching his friends dying left and right here, moving home, investing back in himself, and now he's a working actor and he's about to venture into New York, go after a new representation. And the guy's like, yeah. every time I turn around, he's in, a, he's in an independent film up in his market. And so it's mm -hmm. like, you know, beyond the legacy of my children, I, I think I can share my life, my human revolution with people yeah. to help them make the kind of changes that they need to make themselves. Right. Um, but, oh, yeah, I, but make no mistake about it. 
there's many ways to do this. I just find that this practice is the most, you know, they say expedient means. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're, you're teaching people how to do their own human revolution, right? You're transforming their lives by giving them the tools That's it. or like planting. By my own secure, example. You know? I'm not, I'm not right. preaching exactly. from a place exactly. that I didn't do myself. Do you right. know? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not, exactly. I, I tell them, it's like, I've lost thousands of auditions to book hundreds. Yeah. I'm doing everything exactly. in my power to make sure that doesn't happen to you. I, yeah. <laughs> I took one for the team. I did it. <laughs> you know? Yes. I never, I never thought that teaching would be so incredibly satisfying and watching people grow and understanding the full responsibility of being somebody's mentor and teacher. Mm. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's like I have a thousand children <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that I'm, I'm yeah. responsible for that. I need that. I yeah. need to lead by example. You know, Is there anything really like a lot of good in, stuff today. You sure have. I was just going to say the, if, if, your classes are anything like just this interview and, and what you've shared. They and are. Inspiration. You know, I know that, uh, yeah, these students of yours are incredibly uh, fortunate to have you as a teacher because, yeah, thank you so much. I feel enlivened myself as, as a Buddhist practitioner. I'm like, damn, I need to like – up my game and really, yeah, it just kind of like lift my life condition that much higher. So thank you so much. It's it's called oncamerworkouts.com is our website. And, and uh -huh. yeah, I, I only teach one day a week just because of my schedule wow. of like auditions on my own. So I only teach on mm -hmm. Wednesdays and I do what's called an on-camera workout where I send people material from actively casting things. They have to shoot it and upload it and we watch the nice. playback in there and then we read the material live. And then I do what's called core labs like I did last night, um, teaching fundamentals of building an audition from start to finish, from first time mm -hmm. you get the script to shooting your self tape and, 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 you know, creating human beings and things on the other side of the camera. But yeah, I, this is how I teach. Uh, it, it's very, it's a, it, it can be very frustrating and angers me sometimes when I'm seeing people online on Instagram having tens of hundreds of thousands or millions of followers. Listening mm -hmm. to bullshit. <laughs> I was yeah. just like, have you been on a set? Do you know? <laughs> like I go, like you're why, you know, there's something about this time where people are seeking it, mm. but they're just, they don't, they can't discern the differences between someone who really does it and someone who did it and being paid is asking for money from you to, to learn it. It's kind of frustrating to me. It's like, yeah. it's as, as if I were to present myself, former actor teaching you how to be an actor. Just think about that for a second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. Well, there's a lot Former of those casting out there. Now, now turn, now turned acting coach. So like I, yeah. so I didn't, I did do what you're paying me to do, but I'm not doing that now because I've done, I'm, I'm something else now. Right. Like you know, right. and just the, it just makes me laugh because I say to people, I go, you want to be a working actor, learn, study, train from a working actor. Period. Yeah. I know who they are. They're out there, or. You find somebody who is a specialist, who specializes. Larry Moss is a specialist. There's another right. guy named Tim Phillips who uh, wrote a book called Audition for Your Career, Not the Job. 40 mm -hmm. years specializing in self-tape, you know, in auditions. I specialize yeah. in self-tapes because this is what yeah. I do. I self-tape, yeah. you know, two, three times a week. So, you know, find the specialist in the things that you do that you want to do, not necessarily mm -hmm. a philosopher. Someone who talks about theory and philosophy and has not been on a set recently where all the sets now are three cameras and you have to adjust yourself to the three cameras at the same time, you know? So, right. um, yeah, so I've just, you know, it's true. This is a, you're just getting a little taste of <laughs> the, uh, what I call my tribe, the on-camera workout tribe. I have a tribe of people. That's awesome. A thousand I'm strong. Curious. Yes, yes. And I know it's going to keep on growing. Um, I'm curious, kind of what brings you the most happiness now versus when you started out at, you know, in your 20s in New York City, trying to make all the things kind of come together? Has that changed from then to now? I know you've had so many life experiences, both on set and, you know, in personal life and everything. But uh, just curious, kind of what those differences may be. Uh, somebody was saying the mark of real success is that your adult children mm -hmm. want to be with you. They want to hang out mm. with you. They want to enjoy your company. Yeah, and uh, I think that's right because I because mm. I had a little taste of that experience with my son and I in New York. He was doing an internship. Uh, his school has uh, what's called field work the first six weeks of the year. So he was in New York at a theater company doing internship for free, mm. paid for yeah, yeah. thankfully by 
being on the righteous gemstones. <laughs> it's like his, t- his TV work under my, uh, you know underwrites his ability to work for theater companies for free. But the the fact that we uh, that um, we were able to go places and do things together as father and son now mm. as a young adult, you know, mm. and the same thing holds true for my daughter of like you know. We had we had a road trip together from Ithaca, New York, to Chicago when she was going to University of Chicago, hmm. and to be able to go to a restaurant together. And she's old enough to have a drink, and we have a drink together. And we went to a bar, and like it. And I and I was just like to be able to have a healthy, loving um, relationship with my adult children is super fucking awesome, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and. Yeah. Uh, and there's times where my wife and I just kind of sit back and just kind of marvel at it all, you know. Mm, yeah. And for me, that's 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 pretty that's pretty good, you know. That brings me a great deal of satisfaction and happiness. And I just finished being on set. I hadn't been on set since November, so December, January, February, March. Yeah, you know, so like four months. <laughs> and there's just I'm in my element on set. You know, I really Mm -hmm. like, it's so funny. The the costume designer is a Buddhist. I like, she knew it when we did a costume fitting. Cause I was like the way I was talking about like, yeah, you know, the thing for me now is not so much about like publish accomplishment. It's about how can I, how can I help others? It's not Mm -hmm. so much about me and like getting to a certain status in life. It's really about like, how can I find, how can I help others? How can I put the, bring the ladder and show others away? You know what I mean? Right. And she was like, Buddhist. <laughs> and then she knew it, but she didn't say it in the costume fitting, right? And the way I'm yeah. talking and this and this and mission and purpose and all. And then <laughs> then she gets on set and I say something. I'm like, oh, I'm a Buddhist. She goes, wait a minute. I knew it. I knew it. Like, it was like the last day I'm shooting. And she's like, he's yeah. a Buddhist. He goes, she goes, you know, her two costume assistants were like, man, that James Dumont, he's like, he's like electric, man. He's just like, he's so positive. <laughs> and he talks about his children. He's very honest. And he's, you know, and he's a Buddhist like you. And so she comes out. She goes, I knew you were Buddhist. I knew it. I've been a Buddhist since 77. I was like, oh, my wow. God. You're like, so it was like, and she goes, you, you come on set and it's like, every, you make everybody feel good. You know, this is why this director brought you back. You know, this is why right. this director worked with you again. It's like you met, you remember everybody's name. You make everybody mm-hmm. laugh. You tell stories. You you do your work. You keep things light. You you sit down quietly when you need to be quiet, you know, because get the work done. And it's just like, you know, how I, you know, I shock a book everybody with my life. You yes. know, this is not just a philosophy. You know, this is a life. This is a way of living, not a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. This is a way of living. Yes. And. You know, all those years of struggle and all the mud and the nutrients allow me to be this beautiful flower that bears fruit. And yes. then I wa- – and that, you know, as I learned when I went to the Florida Nature Culture Center where I first gave my experience, um, or, or second time I gave my experience. But the point is, is that, you know, it's everywhere I go is the Buddha's land. Hmm. I, because I'm a Buddha and I'm manifesting yeah. my my ultimate greatest potential every single day. Everywhere I go is the Buddha's land. Yep. The way I carry myself, the way I talk to people, the way I listen, you know, or or not listen, <laughs> or you know, that <laughs> things I have to work on, you know. But the yeah. point is, where I go is the Buddha's land. And so when I come into an environment, you know, the Quincy Jones used to say, you know, there's only so many days that you're on this planet. If you live to this amount, if this age, is this how many days you're on the planet? I want to make sure that I make the most of that time that I'm here because when I leave here, I want to, I want people to know that I came through here. And I was like, trust me, people know Quincy Jones came like, you don't, you don't have to worry about that. We all know yeah. what, but that's kind of where my head's at now is that mm-hmm. is, you know, how much of an impact can I have on other people's lives yeah. while I'm here? Yeah. Um, and Robin Williams had a whole thing on Instagram about, you know, the ego goes away at a certain point and it becomes about others, mm-hmm. helping and serving others. Yes. And and how can one do that? And I think the miss the people don't understand now, at least some don't understand, is that <laughs> by helping others, do we help to heal ourselves? Absolutely. Loving others increases our ability to self-love and self-actualize. Right. And it's not, I know self people go like, ah, it's all about yourself, self, 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 self. It's like, well, there's a lot of selves. There's a, some negatives and positives. 
There's self-love. Yeah. There's also self-sabotage. There's also self-destruct. There's also, right. you know, self-care. You know, the, the, it cuts both ways. Mm -hmm. but, it, but it's like um, I feel like our ability serving others has always felt good f to me. And I, I know I'm not alone. And so I think the idea is to try to find ways to continue to serve others. And that comes down to being the kind of creating the kind of human beings that I may, you know, that represent things that are negative and racist and homophobic. And you know what I mean? Like I have to mm -hmm. be do service to those people in order to keep that to, for the, for the greater good and the greater message. So sometimes yeah. I'm playing roles in which that, that are that don't reflect who I am, but my responsibility is to be truthful to them in order to point out the messages of their f f f you know failings and their fraud you know fraudulent ideas or ideology right. or thinking, right. you know, yeah, you know, as, as Shakespeare said, to hold is toer a mirror to nature. My job mm -hmm. is still make people to look at this, even in all its beauty and ugliness and everything else in between. I still have the responsibility of that, and yeah. I also feel like you know. What I do in its base form is a, I'm a storyteller mm -hmm. and I might be telling someone else's story, but I'm the person who's in the front of the camera telling the story. That's and so that. I always re encourage my – I tell actors, don't ever let anybody disrespect you mm -hmm. because, oh, well, you know, where do you wait tables? It's like, oh, yeah, I'm sure you're looking for a job, right? You know, it's like there's all this disparaging things about, about story, but you're a, we're a storyteller. The most original form of communication between human beings were storytellers. They mm -hmm. didn't even have words. They would grunt and they would, they would carve rocks on walls to tell the history of the people that were before. This is way right. before lawyers and doctors and politicians and billionaires, right? Storytellers were the first people that communicated the human life and the condition of the people that were before us. So don't ever yeah. let anyone ever tell you disrespect you because you're telling stories of the human condition of the time and the world that we're in. And that's a, that's a huge mission and something I take very seriously and I enjoy and have fun with, you know, I get, to, I yeah. love playing characters that I have, you know, Brian Cranston and I were talking about, you know, what is it about these, the nicest guys get to play the worst fucking people. I was like, you and I play the most debased, nastiest people. We're doing Trumbo together. And he goes, mm. because we would never say or do any of the things that we do. And I was like, exactly. We would never do this in our everyday life. We get this, this, this vessel, this opportunity mm. to, to, you know, to, to put these people out there that are just awful and horrific. But, mm. but we would never say or do any of these things in our everyday life. Never. Yeah. So it's freeing in that regard, you know, it, but that's, but that is, I think, I think, you know, being a storyteller of, you know, uh, and, and a, a human practitioner of this Buddhism mm. in the 21st century is it's, it, this is, this is super important, you know? Yeah. It's super important, with, you know, and I, and I, and I have to lead by example. I don't, I don't want to be, um, uh, I don't want to do or anything that, that, that creates harm or something shameful or leaves a legacy that doesn't live up to the struggle, you know, mm. yeah, something of that, that is of honor and worth, you know? Yeah. I'm curious kind of what is a day in the life? Like, I know you shared a little bit like, you know, Wednesdays are your days when you're doing the auditions uh, or your classes rather on self tape. Um, but you know, like on average kind of, you know, what does your day look like? Because you are a working actor. You're, you know, like you said, you just got off set. And I think yeah. it's hysterical that you're like, what was it? November, December, January. It's like, yeah, okay. It's been four months, but like for a lot of actors, you know, it's been, who knows how long, you know, years, but I'm um, just years. curious. Like, what, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think when I'm, uh, you know, it it, my, it it varies because I'm, you know, we're on the third season. We just finished the third season of the Righteous Gemstones in November. Such a great show. Or December, yeah. they finished up the season. It'll start airing in June. Thank you. Um, it'll start airing in June. Um, there'll be not there'll be ten episodes with a longer pilot. Um, nice. Uh, with longer first, there's always a one hour yeah. in the first and one hour in the first back. episode. So, yeah. You know, we do yeah. nine episodes, but it's really eleven if you think about it, because they're half mm. hour. You know, forty minutes sometimes. Second season, I did ten episodes. I did I did five episodes in ten days, hmm. which was kind of a miracle. So we were born <laughs> yeah, the, the Goon Squad that were part of Jesse, Gem, you know Jesse Gemstone's Goon Squad, who we are, and, yeah. we're, and we are really now like season three. We are we are his Goon Squad. We will do we we 
we're ass kickers for Christ. We'll do whatever he says. We'll it. do his bidding. We take care. We take care of anything Jesse wants. We do. So it's yeah. uh, you know no spoiler alerts there, but it's going to be super fun. Nice. Um, uh, so it's a little bit of challenging when I'm doing gemstones. I live in New Orleans. And so we have to fly. There's no real direct flight. So we fly from here to Atlanta to Charleston where we work. Um, so second season I was able to – was was kind of a dream because, I mean, you know, we did all – like we we do Monday through Friday shooting. We don't shoot on the weekend. So we knocked out five episodes in 10 days, which was amazing. Yeah. And then this last season, season three – I did five episodes, but over six months. <laughs> wow. Very different than two weeks. So, oh, sure. yeah. <laughs> you know, they'll give us, they'll tell us when we're traveling. This is what your whole days are. This is, you know, this is where your hotel is. This is where your car, mm. you know, they arrange all this stuff for us. Thank goodness. You know, we've been able to negotiate that over the years. Um, yeah. My son is also on the show as well. He plays Pontius Gemstone. Um, Dan, uh, Danny's uh, uh, Jesse Gemstone's middle, angry middle son. He's got a lot of great yeah. stuff this season. That'll ne- definitely nice. pull him out of the pack uh, from, you know, being just another one of the kids in the group. Um, nice. And so, you know, that that's a little bit of a challenge in terms of just communicating. And my wife is really good about calendars and schedules. And so, mm. you know, um, we just kind of keep track of those things via email and communicate. Communication is the key. And then I work up in New York a good um, – so my day my day to day routine is I, I get up uh, – depends. I, I'm a late night person. So I'm not – my wife is up at 4 or 5 in the morning. I, 10 or 11, maybe my thing. Um, (laughs) I'll get up and do Gagno, then have lunch. You know, um, I do coaching. I do private coaching on Mondays and Tuesdays, um, pretty much from 10 to five, uh, one hour slots in the, in the morning and then half hour slots in the afternoon. If people Mm -hmm. have auditions or they want me to look at their like self tapes, or they want me to look at their headshots or resumes, or, you know, we may put a career blueprint together to kind of map out their, you know, what they want to do. Um, so that's Mm -hmm. Mondays and Tuesdays are usually, 10 to five in there. Wednesdays I call are my hump day. I do a, what's called a morning lunch, a lunch crunch that goes from uh, nine to noon, 11 to nine to noon Pacific time, 11 to two uh, central, and then noon to three uh, East coast time. And that's, in, that's my morning session. That's for the workouts where people are working on perfecting their uh, self tapes. And then Wednesday evening, like last night I do what's called core work is helping teaching people a four part fundamental. It's like a four week course of like fundamentals of, you know, breaking down an audition from scratch to self tape. And mm. that's Wednesday nights. And then Thursday I'm off. I, I used to teach on Thursday nights too. I used to teach mm. on Monday nights. Um, and then now I, wow. uh, I've been doing when I'm back home, I do a live workout in my home in new Orleans on Saturdays. So oh, uh, cool. Thursday night I'll have, you know, have downtime. I'll have Friday, you know, my mom is here. I moved my mom from Colorado to um, Metairie, Louisiana. So nice. um, she's 20 minutes away. So she's got doctor's appointments. She's about to have knee surgery. So mm-hmm. life's about to get very interesting. And then Fridays, <laughs> I, I do a Friday, I do a Q&A on, on, uh, on Clubhouse. Every Friday oh. I do an actor to actor Q&A free on Clubhouse. Nice. And that's usually five to seven central time, uh, which is three to five Pacific <laughs> and six to eight on East Coast. And I do yeah. those free every Friday just to have an actor to actor conversation. I like to tell the actor's journey and the actor's story. Um, mm-hmm. And it's not necessarily always famous actors. It's mostly guys like me, journeyman actors. This week we got a guy named David D. Montrell who's going to uh, teach us as well. He also wrote the book Working Actor. So I have, I do like a kind of like you do. I do like a little Q&A and we focus on the actor's journey from where they nice. started the first time to where they are now and how, you know, and then that's for free. I do those for free. I used to do them for charity and raised about $20,000 for different charities, about Incredible. 40 different charities all over the world. Um, I used to do them on Zoom. And then on Sundays, uh, Saturday I have off unless I'm teaching live. I'm teaching live this Saturday. I do an on-camera workout live so people get the idea of getting notes or direction in person in the room for when we get to the point that they're having a call back or something like that and it's not on Zoom, mm-hmm. preparing mm-hmm. people for me being able to take notes or adjustments in real time. And then on Sunday, I do a free uh, self-tape Sunday where I kind of talk about self-tapes. That's on Clubhouse as well. Um, the time always varies depending on what my Sunday's like. I think I'm going to go to something with my wife in the evening, so I'll maybe do it earlier this Sunday. But so on Fridays and Sundays for free, uh, it's under the Actors Breakfast Club room uh, mm. on Clubhouse, which I find to be a really great place. Um, I just like the people there. I've you know some of the students that came out of Clubhouse are just they, they're serious and diligent, and so 
I find that's a great way for me to meet and, you know, get new students and also to kind of build relationships with people. And so it's been, so yes, that's my week. <laughs> nice. No, I was literally going to say, when do you have time to actually do your own auditions? <laughs> yeah. Whenever, whenever I have to figure that out, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you're a very, very point, busy guy. You no, know, Alan, as you know, is I chanted to have this kind of life, you know, right, careful right. what you chant for. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, ha- I, I, you know, that's what the whole point of doing, you know, Buddhist activities, doing Soka group or doing Gajakai or doing, mm-hmm. you know, I did, I did uh, gymnastics. I did the, the chorus, you know, like yeah. we did these activities in order to expand our capacity and our ability to um, handle, maintain responsibility, you know? Right. Um, so it's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's our benefit, but it's also our responsibility. So, um, yeah, and some sometimes there's you know so sometimes there's a lot of daimoku in there and sometimes there's not. Sometimes there's a lot of sleep in there and sometimes there's not. Sometimes yeah. there's some really good healthy eating patterns. Sometimes there's not. You know, but uh, <laughs> you know that's why it's called the human revolution. You know, it's not yeah. you're not trying to be perfect or right. You're just trying yeah. to be human. You know. Yeah. And um, you know, and sometimes I find up uh, now I'm back home. I'm going to get on a you know workout routine and kind of find. Mm. That'll help my sleeping pattern. That'll help my freeing up myself for Daimoku. Will help my, you know, keeping my energy sustained. You know, but without yeah. the practice, that just one hundred percent impossible. There's just no way. And I think any other philosophy or ideology that would that would put me in my head or put me in another outside of myself, I, I just never. I don't think that would work for me. Hmm. Not that kind of person. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I'm just curious, kind of who has been your biggest supporter or fan that's kind of gotten you through this? Um, you know, obviously you have a very, you know, a very busy life and, you know, you kind of have been able to not only stay afloat, but, you know, make this magnificent life. But that's, as you've said many times over, you know, there's no easy feat. So has there been someone or some ones that have really been the the backbone or support for you going through all these ups and downs? I mean, without, without question, my wife, is, you know, yeah. like just a rock, you know, and just yeah. solid and always there and a, a, a little small little gestures of love through making lunch when I'm in the middle of my teaching or, you know, dinner when I needed to take a nap, you know, like last mm-hmm. night like, and they're on the house, you know, like, you know, like little flowers and little things, you know, like the point is, is that there's these deeply, deeply uh, supportive acts of love that I think are mm-hmm. like, you know. And being the wife of an actor with the with the healthy ego that I have, or or a healthy narcissist, maybe I was that might be the term. <laughs> you know, uh, it's not easy. It's not easy being married to an actor who constantly needs you know love and attention, and you know, mm. or if I'm, you know, I think it's easier now that I'm that I'm teaching. So it's like you know, I I have another outlet when I'm working or when I'm doing plays or things. I have ways in which that I. I get satisfied in other ways that I don't have to be so reliant upon. And my wife is pretty funny. Like you said that already. Oh yeah. No, you told me that this is the second time you told me. Like, you know what I mean? And she just reminds me that like, you know, it's like, you know, I, sometimes when I'm away, I like have to wait like two days to talk to her. So I don't give her the exact same thing that I said the night, the day before. But, um, and I do feel like more so than ever before, um, my connection to, President Ikeda, Daisaku Ikeda, Sensei, mm. uh, is is much more deeper than it ever has been before. I think I really, mm. um, I I think early in my practice, I was a f- scared of kind of a idyllic, you know, idyllic like a like a god or kind of a, you know, like a cultish. I was afraid of like that kind of the way in which people were talking about President Ikeda. That right, I think right. I kind of shied away from it. And then the more that I listened in the writings and the readings and watched video. But I must say, but if 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 anyone's listening and they have not been to the Florida Nature Culture Center, go. I, mm-hmm. I I went for the first time in September and I felt sensei everywhere. I felt his heart. Mm-hmm. I felt his love and compassion for the membership. I felt his a sense of of, of serene, a sense of. Um, it's interesting about the Florida Nature Culture Center, and I felt like a total idiot. I was such a <laughs> small minded actor when I, I was such a small minded actor that when it was built, I was mm-hmm. so fearful of leaving New York or LA for fear of losing a job. 
mm-hmm. that I robbed yes. myself of the experience of going to the Florida Nature Culture Center. I was mm-hmm. so small minded to think, whereas the reality is going there at the time that I probably could have gone in there may have also changed in, in, in my life in a whole deeper, profound way than I probably wouldn't have imagined. And that's yeah. where I felt a little ashamed and kind of embarrassed because I was like, I denied myself to stop <laughs> everything and be fo- – I did this before. I stopped everything and was focused on my practice. Why didn't I – I don't know why. Why did I spend s- – this place has been here for 20 years. I've been practicing mm-hmm. for 35. Like why did I just do this now? You know, right, right. And it was, it, I was just embarrassed, you know, like to kind of go like, wow, how small minded, uh, meaning if I made that cause, I think that that kind of cause and what's come out of this, you know, and that came out of my experience that I read in, in, in New Orleans and then brought that to the Florida Nature. That's what got me to the Florida Nature Culture Center. Then they agreed to this. Hmm. Then it became like the Saturday night big experience. Then it became published in the World Tribune. <laughs> you know, right. then millions of people were able to see that experience. Right. You know, who's to say to think that couldn't have happened 20 years earlier? So it's just very – so for me, I think – and and it's, what's really great is to see my son really understanding the mentor and disciple relationship and, and present Akita's example of how right. – of living this practice and living and, – and the responsibility of being a, a, an emissary of, of Buddhism, you know. And, and yeah. people too, I know I have a lot of – you know, a lot of my students and friends are deeply Christian – and mm. but also cannot deny <laughs> that my practice has a lot to do with who I am. So it's Absolutely. like yeah. the seed of who inspires us to live our greatest self, whether it be in their eyes Christ or an example of Christ, or in our eyes, our you know, our, our Buddhahood, you know, it's kind of hard to question that what I'm doing is a wrong and not working because of who I am and how I live. And I also yeah. have a great deal of respect for them. That if the, if if God's example is a way in which that they've manifested their their the, all their potential, I have great deal of respect for that as well. Just to see yeah. of how we do it may be different, but how it manifests in the world. Because I had a you know devout you know born again Christian friend of mine who you know was a musician, got into Juilliard, then he went to law school, then he became like a you know a lawyer for you know for disenfranchised, you know, like helping the homeless. I mean like like that guy like lived it. He lived yeah. it. He lived the Bible, yeah. you know? And so and but he knows also that I live my philosophy. So it was yeah. like it's interesting how we can, you know, especially at these times, you know, th- there are big differences between Christianity and Buddhism, you know? Yeah. But how one manifests those things can be very similar. And Absolutely. so rather than, oh, you're, what you're doing is wrong or what I'm doing is right. It's like, no, I, I can, I can, we can, we can have this different seeds of enlightenment, but it, 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 the good news is as long as it manifests in a world. So I can, I can respect that. You know, yeah. I think when somebody is trying to kind of, point out how wrong it is or how or how it seems so you know what your uh, buddhism is so self 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 well it's also mm. self actualization it's also self love right. it's also self reliance it's also uh, uh selflessness it's also giving yeah. you know you're practicing for yourself and for others you know and i right. give people the analogy that's always on, on every plane that we go on it's a simple simple thing in the air when there's a problem a mask is going to come down. And yes, our tendency is let's try to save our child. The truth is you got to put your mask on first. So first. It might not That's be right. enough oxygen for you to get to your child. So do you have to – so as much as may, people may think, you know, this is a self-centered thing, there's also some realistic things to it, which is you've got to put your own mask on first. You've got to, you've got yeah. to do your own human revolution in order right. to help others. You've got to be able to exactly. breathe in order to do that. And so um, that's usually my pushback when someone when someone's giving me a little bit of throwing some sh- sh- Buddhist shade, uh, put some shade on my Buddhism, you know, as, as I yeah. go, no, no, no. I'm, you know, I'm living what I, this is not a philosophy. This is, a, this, yeah. is a, this is how I live, you yeah. know, um, and that didn't happen overnight, you know? Yeah. Well, I think the beauty of that too is the fact that, you know, I was talking to another 
Buddhist practitioner or a member of, you know, our community. And they're just sharing that, you know, their Christian family actually realized through that person's practice that they're, we as Buddhists are so quote unquote devout in the sense that every morning and evening we are practicing, right? It's, it's something that we commit ourselves to in order to be a better self. Hopefully. And a lot of Christians, yeah, hopefully, yeah, exactly. Hopefully. But a lot of Christians don't even do that. Right. And so but we're through not going to church once a week. We're going to church exactly. twice, twice a day. Twice That's a day. Different. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, you're making that and commitment for yourself. it's not during the yourself. holidays. It's every day. <laughs> I'm checking in every exactly. day. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, it's yeah. 10 times, you know, it's, it's 14 times a week. Yeah. That's exactly. pretty devout, you know, yeah. if you really yeah. think about that. And so, you know, yeah. So, and it's good. Somebody needs to, I think, but I do think we also have to have, you know, we don't have the, the patent you know, on, on, on all, all enlightenment and all happiness. Right. We got a pretty good, <laughs> got some pretty good, <laughs> pretty good, you know, pretty good hold on it, but we don't have the patent on it. We didn't, we didn't invent yeah. it. We were just living it, you know? So I do feel yeah. it's like, you know, uh, cause I do have a few students too, that, you know, as you would, as you would imagine in my classes, I mean, I, I, uh, you know, I'm always talking about, one form of Buddhism or another, or using the 10 worlds as an analogy for certain, certain, you know, human beings or human revolution as a concept, or always yeah. talking about the concept, which I think is an important one, especially for this podcast, is that that turning poison into medicine, mm -hmm. man, that's everything. Yeah. Being able to take your pains and your sufferings and turn them, as I'm doing, is take the pains and sufferings of the things that I've gone through in my early life. And turning them into human beings that you can believe and live and live through and be inspired by or be repulsed by or affected by, you know, mm. turning that poison into medicine is everything, yeah. you know. And I think, you know, all all obstacles are opportunities. It's just when you're in them, it just feels overwhelming. You feel like you can't get through them. But it's like – but the truth is, it's like it, it, it makes you stronger, you know, and, and, you know, it's temporary. And when you get on the other side of it, you're just like, wow, you have this different perspective on it. But the idea of turning poison into medicine to me is like, that's, that's it. And I think that that can happen on, on a daily and it can happen very quickly. That's why I love that phrase of like, you can doubt your doubts. When Lisa said, you can mm. doubt your, is that really going to happen? Am I really going to lose my friend? Is this really going is to, is, is, is Trump really going to run again? Is, you know, like, like, is that, is that really going to happen? Do you know? I'm, I'm, I'm calling bullshit on that. I'm going to doubt my yeah. doubts. And I think we, that, that I think what's, what's deeply profound about this practice is that we, 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 we are governed by the law of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. That is a law. You don't have to yeah. – like I say to people, it's like cause and effect is like gravity. Yep. You don't have to have deep and devout faith in gravity. You don't even under, need to understand the scientific principles of gravity. If I step out my second-story window and, I, and I, if I step out, I'm going to fall. That's a truth. That's an unequivocal truth. Yes. And all the philosophy and all the prayers and all the understanding of science behind gravity doesn't fucking matter. The fundamental truth is I'm going to fall. Yeah. And in terms of cause and effect is that every thought, every word, every action has a positive and negative effect. And mm -hmm. when you begin to chant, you have – maybe you have this you know, garden hose analogy. Maybe you have this garden hose filled with a whole bunch of fucking mud and leaves and you're turning the water on it and, it, and maybe no water comes through it first. But yeah. eventually, eventually through chanting more like the water comes and the leaves and the mud, right? The leaves and the mud and the dirt from the winter and then water comes flowing through, right? So you're transforming your, 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 your poison into medicine. You're, the very mm -hmm. things that your complication, the very problems and obstacles and the, the genetic given circumstances you came into this world, it's like you're going to turn them into – this beautiful flower that bears fruit, the fresh water is going to flow through and there's unfettered possibility of hope and uh, enthusiasm and love and kindness and generosity, right? And appreciation, you know, it's like it doesn't happen overnight. But the, the point yeah. is one has to identify your poisons, 
identify, and that may be your negative thoughts, words, and actions, that, that, you know, looking at other people differently than you, treating people less than, right? Um, and being mindful of how we kind of, you know, sabotage ourselves. I did a, two things on Instagram that I really love if people want to follow me on Instagram. Um, I did this called uh, – we did we we did the, called the the self love challenge. So each day mm. you walk up and you and you each day you say, you know you you give yourself a compliment. It's a thirty day compliment challenge, and what mm. you're doing is you're giving yourself a compliment that someone didn't give you. Mm. See what we stems back to our member talking about mirroring and matching someone. Someone right, didn't right. acknowledge or love you a certain way, so you're going to give yourself a compliment that someone should have given you but they didn't. And then the deep, profound part of that is then you have to forgive that person for not meeting or matching you or having their own insecurity. You have to let that go. It's really wow. deep. Yeah. You give yourself the compliment. You give yourself the self love that you weren't that you weren't given by someone, and it and it, and in some cases it helps you to heal, and it also allows you to let go of that person or persons that are constantly uh, you know self sabotaging you or, or you're trying to please them right. So that was like that was an interesting one. It was the self day the thirty, and then recently we did the twenty eight day um, declaration challenge. So for twenty eight mm -hmm. days you declare, "I am, I am loving, I am loving," and you own that. You know, this is who I am. I'm declaring who I am to the world because mm -hmm. there was a lot of great little things on Instagram that goes around. Guys said the world doesn't give you what you want; it shows you who you are. Mm -hmm. So you have Very to true. determine who you are. Don't don't ask for the world to give you what you want. That's a mistake. You have to declare who you are. I am a Buddhist. Mm. I'm a father. I am loving. I have like, I have them all up on the wall in here. You know, <laughs> I am enough. Yeah, There's a deep a one. one. I am enough yeah. as I am. Yeah. It's a big one. But if you don't declare that, you can't expect the world to respond in any particular way. If you walk around mm. constantly letting the world decide, I'm saying this last night in my workouts, don't let the, don't, in the core work, don't let the business or the industry decide who you are and what roles you should and shouldn't do. Yeah. Declare for yourself. I am this person. Mm. Yeah. And so when we make those kind of declarations, the environment responds. Remember, as I said before, the person and the environment are one. One. Yep. If you're polluted in your mind and if you're negative and you're, you're constantly, you know, uh, self critical, you know, being critical of yourself, the world is going to do the exact same thing. The world's responding to that. So you have to make right. a declaration of who you are in the world. Mm. You know, and that's that comes down to our Buddhist practice of making determinations and goals to transform. Because some yeah. of those inherent poisons, you inherit it. You, th you those are part of your cultural, historical and ancestry. Yeah. You know, you were brought into this country under under uh, you were brought to this country as a slave. Your father's father's father was a slave. You know, you were brought in here under false pretense. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't ask to be here. You didn't ask to be in the situation that you were in. Right. But the real question is in the course of the, of your physical life while you're here, you know, how much can you change? How much can you humanly revolt against who you were and who you are and who you want to be? And yeah. that, that gets me up in the morning. <laughs> yeah. That gets me up in the morning and I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. I don't know. I love it. I love it. Um, so just yeah. to kind of, we're getting close to the, the end of our, our interview. I know. Here, I was like, you said an hour and a half and I was like, I knew we were going to go two hours <laughs> <laughs> easily. Yeah. I love it. I got, I got um, too much. No, no, it's great. I love it. You're, you're so giving as you're talking about, you know, it's kind of like you're, you're, uh, you're sharing everything that you have gone through so other people can kind of do their own human revolution and change by listening to this and yeah. you know, taking your classes as well. I, I see um, no value in holding back information, experience, and knowledge. It doesn't, it yeah. doesn't have value to me if I can't share it. Yeah. What's the Period. point? Yeah. What's yeah, the point exactly. of holding all this? If I can't, if I can't share it, it has no value to me. Yeah. So looking to the future, kind of what are maybe some goals that you have set for yourself for the next like three to five or even 10 years from now, uh, kind of both as an actor, as a coach, as father, everything? I think um, when you put that question down, I thought about that a little bit because I, you know, mm. I used to have a, a list of like every year I had the, de you know, determination list, you know, like everybody's got New Year's resolutions and I would mm -hmm. every year I'd have these lists and lists and lists and lists and lists, right? Then I realized yeah. that I didn't I didn't necessarily need those lists or vision boards. 
Hmm. Uh, what I ha- what I needed to do each day was to make sure that each day I'm I am manifesting my Buddha nature, my ultimate potential. Because I yeah. think my fear, and I ask this question in my when I'm doing my Q and A's, what's your greatest fear? And almost mm. always they go that I'm not going to have enough time to achieve all that I think I'm capable of, that I'm not going to wow. live up to my potential. Hmm. That's almost like 80% of the people respond with that. With that is because they go, I'm wow. not going to have enough time and I'm not going to be able to live up to my potential. So I mm. think I used to put a lot of pressure on myself and I would go to the Gahunzen like a wishing well and make the asks <laughs> as opposed to the determinations. And so that's yeah. changed. Is I is that in terms of I want to be able to have the kind of financial freedom that I can produce projects that I'm in that give other people work, mm. and that I don't yeah. have to audition and I don't have to I can create my own work. So yeah. I think, and I'm moving in that direction more and more. But I'm realizing how incredibly – if you thought being an actor is hard, <laughs> try, to get somebody to, try to get somebody to sign off on a TV pilot, just a pilot yeah. that's probably cost about $30 million to do it. Wow. Right. Wow. So it's yeah. one thing to be an actor and to get a job, but try to get a network or try to get a studio or try to get – and I got all the bells and I – got, I got an Emmy and Golden Globe winning actor attached to ZP as an actor – but he really wants yeah. to direct the pilot. I got, you know, other people interested, but it's like, man, if, if you think it's hard being an actor, man, being a producer, and I have a project that's like, this is the next NCIS. Like, this is it. Mm. I have it. I got all the, I got everything. I got it written down. I got the Bible. I got, you know, like, I got a, you know, a pitch deck that people are like, man, every, no. And it's hard. It's like yeah. we get two steps forward. We send, then we have to wait for this. This person passes because they're busy. Okay, then we're going to go on to the next. And it's just like dee, 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 dee. so. I think for me, you know, moving forward, um, I, you know, I was doing my one man show of my my life as a DJ before my daughter was born, mm-hmm. and I've left that collect dust in the last twenty one years. So mm-hmm. I definitely may we want to dust that off. I'd like nice. to get back to doing the theater. I'd like to be able to produce things that I'm in that I have. I, I did my own TV pilot called that guy. Cause I am a, that guy. People go like, you look familiar. It's like, are you my son's soccer coach? And I'm like, no, I'm a, that guy. And, oh, what kind of things that, you know? And I was like, and I lay like five or things down like, Oh no, 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 not those. And I was like, no, those are the things I was really in. Like, are you going to argue with me by credits? Do I have to like, you know, do a tap dance for you? Like, so the, so I did this pilot called that guy, which I thought was Mm -hmm. very interesting and funny about what it's like to be in fame purgatory. You're like, you're known, Mm. but you're not famous. Like you're kind of like in this little, you know, and people treat you accordingly. You know, it's like you're in a movie, and you're on the red carpet of a movie that you're in, but then Eric yeah. Estrada comes up, or the the skanks of you know the skanks of Orange County come up, you know it's like some reality <laughs> hose, and like and everybody wants to pay attention. I'm like I'm in this movie, like what the fuck yeah. are you doing? Yeah, like, yeah. Like I'm, you know, it's like I get no respect. You know, it's like really. So it's like a little bit of curb, a little bit of you know Rodney Danger. So, but it's what's funny. It was funny stuff, but I just. I didn't have a lot of t- – I ran out of time. You know, it was like mm-hmm. I, I – I, and now it, I was teaching my daughter how to drive in one episode and now she's 21 and drives a lot. So it's like – so I might get back to that idea and concept. So for me, I – but the joy of doing that is kind of like doing gemstones, which is that, you know, I had ultimately – like I was trying to do things that I thought were super, super funny and profound. Mm-hmm. And and I had all control over that. And I wrote it and I created the idea. And for me, it's like I do want to kind of get back to that. Um, mm. I don't know where that's going to fit in my daily schedule because I just told you my schedule. Seriously. But it's like, you know, uh, and I have other projects that, I, you know, that no one wanted to pay attention to because they were all African-American casts. They just mm. – 10 years ago, no one gave a shit. And now they're like, right. oh, you know, if I get it to Corky yeah. B. Vance, he maybe, or if I get it to my, yeah. you know, this person, you know, it's like now I'm working with these people. I could, you know, so it's like, you know, I think that's the next three to five years for me is trying to find projects that I, that I've, that I've always been passionate about and try to bring them to fruition. But it just requires a lot of time, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Those are, that's, that's kind of the goal. And I do want to get back to that guy because there was a lot of just, 
I had so much fun doing it. I just wanted to do it all the time, all yeah. the time. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, that's all I wanted to do my own show, you know? Yeah. But that, yeah, I mean, that's like the best of it is that if you enjoy doing what you do, then it really isn't work, you know? So it's kind of like, yeah, yeah. that's the best p- place to be living. And me so. and my director was like, how, how much can we, it's just like in gemstones, like how, what can we say or do that is so incredibly funny and heartbreaking at the same time? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'm going to get back to that. Or, or I may just, just cut it up into little things and just put it up on Instagram and go, fuck it. You know, like here, yeah. this yeah. is interesting. This is funny, you know? Because yeah, trying to make you. it into something and trying to, you know, one of my friends was like, you know, worked on Everybody Loves Raymond. He worked on mm-hmm. uh, uh, Men of a Certain Age with me and uh, and um, put me on that. And then he also worked on One Day at a Time. And I was pitching him the concept and showing him what I showed him. And he's like, yeah, but you're not famous. Like no one no one cares. <laughs> like, you know, Larry's famous. Larry shows. And I go, yeah, but that's the whole point. <laughs> the, the whole point is that the guy doesn't get any respect. Like that's that's right. the hook of the thing. You know, yeah. And you're like, yeah, yeah, but who wants to watch a guy that nobody knows? And I was like, well, that's that's also the point too. You know, yeah. Like you're, you're missing the point, bro. These journeyman actors. Yeah, you're missing the yeah. point. Yeah. Like yeah. you just made the point of why my show is great. You know. Yeah. And he's like saying, yeah, I'm just making a point why no one would watch it. And I was like, <laughs> just go work for Norman later, whatever. Like you know, just go, you know. <laughs> So good. Just go, um, just go do another remake of a seventies TV show. Don't don't fucking talk to me about this shit. Was, seriously, yeah. It's not, it was not the kind of support that I was looking for. You know. Yeah, yeah. No kidding. Um, so I always like to ask this question as kind of almost like a message in a bottle to your future self. What would you say to your future self 15 years from now? Um, and you know, whether that's encouragement or that's, um, you know, congratulations or whatever it may be, but I like to say that to the future because, you know, I can take a look back at this episode 15 years from now and say, wow, I accomplished that or whatever it may be. Huh. What would it be? What advice would you give to your 15 self or what would you say to your 15 years from now self? Either or whatever you feel. You don't have to worry so much. Don't worry so much. Hmm. You spend so much time and energy worrying. You have the Gahunzen. Hmm. You have to worry about anything, you know, yeah. stop wasting energy focused on, on, you know, worrying about things that you cannot control when those are things you don't need to worry about anyways. You know, I'm, I'm kind of coming to that moment now, but I think, you know, I'm hoping that 15 years from now, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know, constantly thinking about money or constantly doing this or constantly checking this or, you know what I mean? Yeah. I hope that I'm yeah. not doing that. You know, I'm doing it far less than I have in years previous for sure decades previous yeah but you know there's that whole thing of like you know you when you have a bigger life condition it uh it costs more <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes like, you know <laughs> you know you you like a nicer car you don't want to have to keep having in the shop you say so you get a nicer yeah. car so you you like you lived in small boxes i lived in a whole apartment that's the size of my studio right now i have you know empty bedroom you know like i like space yeah. like i go you know, and I want to have bedrooms available if if my uh, young adult children want to come home. Like they have their room right. is here. It's like it, they're. I don't want them to come back and yeah, you know, we Airbnb that, and I turn there, I turn that into a studio. And it's like <laughs> we don't give a shit about you. You know, it's like we've moved on. You know, <laughs> get away. Yeah. You know, this is. You know, they say don't make your don't make your house so comfortable the kids never leave. I was like, that's you know. So I yes, yeah, so I think for that I think. You know, don't worry so much. Don't don't uh, don't expend too much. Exp- you know, expel too much energy on on that the worry bug. You know, yeah. it's not healthy. It doesn't serve me. Yeah, and you did it's it. There- like, hey, way to go! You did it. That's what you want to say. Fifteen years is you did it. <laughs> that's great. You know, that's less of it. That's less. You turn that poison into medicine. Great. You, you learn that lesson. Good. You moved on. One yes. hopes. That'll be – and, and 15 years from now will be my 50th anniversary of chanting. So, yeah. I wow. better fucking – There we go. That's what's I'm up. 35 now. So 15 years is – that's 50. So – Yeah. I better have gotten rid of some shit by then. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Of absolutely. Between now and then. Ooh, that's a lot of Daimoku between now and then. <laughs> Making you really <laughs> get introspective. <laughs> 
I love it. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> is there a motto or phrase that you live by um, as everything that you are as James Dumont? Well, for certain, I think we, we figured this out to never give up. Mm. That's like yeah. never. Not Giving up is not an option. But I also like this other idea too that there's three there's three kind of models that keep going back and forth in my mind. But the big one is never giving up, because don't you want to see what's going to happen if you don't? Yeah, it's that that's that night bird, you know, beautiful night birds, you know, incredible, you know, she's fighting cancer and she's people are finally figuring out who she is, and she's like, don't you want to see what's going to happen if you never give up? And she never mm -hmm. gave up all the way to the end, and you know, to her death. And yeah. I go, I really like that hopeful optimism of, you know, don't you want to see what happens? There is that little fear of like, well, if you give up, you're never going to know. So True. don't push out, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like if you get, if you keep going, there's some goodies there, but if you give up, then you're always going to feel like I should have, would have, could have. So it's like, so you yeah. don't, you don't never give up no matter what. And then I also like this idea that people are what they do. So if, deeply fundamental human truth. People are not, it's not what they say, people's actions. And I have to, you know, constantly remind myself what actions am I taking that are helpful or detrimental to myself or others. But I do mm -hmm. think the most fundamental human truth is people are what they do, not what they say, as we've painfully learned. Yes. You know? And so looking at, you know, that we're, that we are Buddhists of action, our deeds, our deeds reflect our Buddhist practice, not our words. That yeah. what, you know, how we live, the actions that we take are, are mostly a, a profound manifestation of, of who we are or who we want to be. And so, you know, people are, people are what they do. So I think we need to also look very closely at people's actions. I think we're, hmm. we're easily swayed and, and persuaded by not looking really close at the actions of others. But that means we're not looking at the close of the actions of ourselves. So I think that's another hmm. one. And um, two things define you, your patience when you think or perceive you have nothing hmm. and your attitude when you have everything. Wow. Because I found when people do achieve certain things, arrogance usually rolls into that little, like when you have everything, you, you're, you don't, you forget there was a time where you had nothing. And people yes. who have really been uh, inspiring to me have been. Uh, they've never forgotten that they're like, what are you going to do to me? Like I, I, I lived super poor and very happy. <laughs> yeah. So there's nothing you can do to me because I've lived, I've lived in, you know, squalor and poverty and no food and still was a happy person. So everything else is fucking gravy. But I do mm. think, you know, that whole thing of like, what defines you is, is, is your, your patience. When you mm -hmm. think or perceive that you have nothing, you have to be patient with yourself. And then when everything's going right, what do you do? Do you forget who you were? And you go, see, I told you I'd be amazing. Or do you go, wow, I have such appreciation for where, you know, where I was to where I am, you know, an attitude yeah. of gratitude. So those are the, those three are kind of like, you know, I'm sure there's tons of President Akita quotes that are all along these lines, but mm. those are ones that I kind of, I, 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 navigate between those three all the time because that yeah. looking at my actions is a day-to-day -day thing you know and never giving up is is a not an option but there are times where it's like i don't want to do this anymore i just i say it i say it out loud and i go whoa 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 that's yeah. a cause what do you say what do you mean you don't want to do this anymore it's like no you don't want to audition anymore you don't want to have to prove that you to do you could do this role that you've done five other times which is why they're calling but they want they just want you to prove it again, you know, and I go, mm. you know, and recently I passed on a project from a director I've been wanting to work with for 25 years. Wow. And because the first thing they put in front of me was this really interesting role of the, that I could totally do. And I loved it. And they pinned and availed me for it. And I'm like, great. And then mm -hmm. they go, oh, but you know what? Have them read this other role. It's the opening of the movie. And that was like a great scene. I was like, I love that. And then they come back and they're like, will, be, will he be fat cop number one? for scale working locally <laughs> in, in, oh God. in Boston. And I go, no, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. I've been wanting to work with you for 25 years. And so the first thing you, I showed you was like that I could do this role with this name actor that you have in there that 
I've been wanting to work with you for 25 years and I showed you I can do that and you didn't select me and that's that's fine. Then you came back with this other thing that was really good that I really loved. Opening the movie was super fun and I nailed that. I turned that around in 24 hours and you pinned and availed. Like I did that and then that, that went to somebody else, the famous friend's buddy. And then you come back and go, I'm going to – I'm gonna. it's maybe one line but he likes to do a lot of improv. It will be some action scene. I can't guarantee you're going to get more than this. We're not going to – we're going to put you in a honey wagon, which I haven't had in 20 years. We're going to pay you as if you just got your two vouchers to have a SAG card. I have 80 movies under my belt, another six, you know, another 80 in television. And I go, I don't, I don't think this is the circumstance that I – if I accept this, I don't, I don't think this director is going to respect me at all at, at the level – I'll wait another 25 years to work with him on the level I want. So it's very interesting yeah. to kind of you know, know your worth, know your value. Yes. At a time where there may be a writer's guild strike that I may not work for another six months. Like who knows? Yeah. I, that's not going to happen. Like, I will not be – I'll be on set next week. How about that? I'm going to make that determination. There you go. But the point yes. is is that you kind of go – you know, I'm I'm I I have more value and worth than than you're. You know, I'm sure there's somebody that's going to love and jump at playing Fat Cop Number One, and I have a lot of <laughs> yeah. Boston students that are like, yeah, let, let, I want to open it up for them. I'm good. Yeah, I don't need to do that. I don't need to go backwards. You know. Yeah. So yeah, I think there's you know, never giving up and valuing your work. You know, is important. And 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 having appreciation, uh, and of, of course, it came at a time where I'm being paid three times as much money. I'm working with the director for a second time. You know, I was like, I don't need to go do that, you know? Yeah, yeah. But there was a That's time huge. I was desperate enough to do that. So I think, you know, yeah, it's huge. Yeah. 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 <sighs> Awesome. Well, that actually wraps it up. I just want to know kind of where can everyone find you on social media, your website, uh, and we'll I'll, yeah. obviously I'll put everything down in show yeah. notes as well. But yeah. I'm on uh, – the best way in terms of my teaching is uh, oncamerworkouts.com is Got our it. website and all the class schedules up there. I always tell people, just come observe. Just come observe a class. You'll 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 mm. learn months and months of things in, in hours. Um. And that's uh, oncamerworkouts.com is our website. And then I'm on – we also have an Instagram page, which is called On Camera Workouts on Instagram. There's tons of free videos up there, lots of really inspiring videos and stuff. So, you know, people having financial things is a tough time right now. There's just free content up there. I, I'm about to put a whole bunch of stuff on a, on our website, um, on YouTube, just put all my stuff up there. We're working on that as now just to kind of just give it up and give it out. Just don't yeah. need to be sitting on my computer. And then um, I have an Instagram page, which is James Dumont. It's J-A-M-E-S-D-U-M-O-N-T. And uh, I throw stuff up there. Uh, you know, I have like 800 or something. There's videos and stuff up there that are great. But those are the ways, the best ways, Dimitri. I, Twitter's not so much because, you know, mm -hmm. the Orange Menace was on there. But now – and then the <laughs> other billionaire that could have solved all world hunger decided he would buy that as opposed yeah. to save the planet. It was just crazy to me. It's just like really that same money you could have fed children all over the world for the next decade. Yeah. But this is what you want to – you're you're a billionaire. You can do whatever you want with your money. You're like a like yeah. some comic book you know, villain. <laughs> villain. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? You're like your Iron Man. It's like how does that – but you don't do great stuff this much. I mean, yeah. Okay. Electric cars. Cool. I get it. Oh, but like so you could have just fixed this with like one check, you know? It's like Bezos. Like, really? We bought everything from you all during COVID. Like, can't you just write a check? Just write just write a check to everybody. Yeah. You know, give everybody yeah. their own stimulus. It's like, you know, just you, – you, you don't need it all. Um, so, yeah. So, that was a ways to reach me. Uh, I am on Twitter. It's James K. Dumont. If you do the do the tweet, the twit. And um, <laughs> those are the best ways to reach me. Fantastic. Thank you so much for all of your time. Thank I can't you. wait to uh, yeah. get this out to everybody and have them listen and, and also see uh, and watch. So, um, yeah, thank you so much, James. I appreciate all of your time. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to awesome. your new project thank that you. you just filmed and everything else you're going to put out very soon. Yes. Yep. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, thank third you. season of Gemstones comes out in June, so it should be a lot of fun. I look forward to it.
Thank you so much for watching and listening. And thank you so, so much to James for all of his incredible stories. I hope you enjoyed this episode. This week's Buddhist quote of the week is, A person fully awakened to the jewel-like dignity of their own life is capable of truly respecting that same treasure in others. By Daisaku Ikeda. Thank you so much for watching and listening to this week's episode. Please go ahead and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, a big thumbs up if you're watching here on YouTube. Check out this video for an entire full episode of the Creative Lotus Podcast. And until next week, I say bye-bye and thank you. What is up, Creative Lotus family? Thank you so much for supporting the Creative Lotus Podcast. Go ahead and follow us on social media. On Facebook, we're at the Creative Lotus Podcast. Here on YouTube, maybe you're watching, we're at the Creative Lotus Podcast as well. And on Instagram, we're at the Creative Lotus Pod. And my personal handle is at Alan Zaki. We say thank you once again. Go ahead and subscribe, listen, write a review. And until the next episode, we'll see you there. Have a wonderful day and stay safe. Bye-bye.